I'm delighted to welcome each of you to the seven habits of highly effective people. I believe that your involvement with this material can be one of the most exciting learning experiences of your life. The essential purpose of the seven habits of highly effective people is to learn how to lead your life in a truly effective way. To describe what the seven habits material is, let me share with you what it is not. It is not a quick fix program. It is not a program of the month. It is a process of personal and interpersonal growth and development that will require not only your continuing best efforts, but also your patience. As we all know, real growth and development cannot take place overnight. You must pay the price over an extended period of time to reap the benefits of these habits. Implementing the seven habits will be an upward personal climb like a journey up a steep mountain. It won't be easy. It will be a challenge. As you ascend the mountain, so to speak, with the seven habits material, you'll become acutely aware of the loose gravel, you know, the loose rocks in your life. You may slip occasionally, maybe even fall back a time or two. You will feel the gravity pull of old habits working against you. But I'll assure you, as you continue in your climb and endure in your efforts, you will begin to feel a level of exhilaration and of attaining entirely new heights in your life, higher and higher levels of effectiveness. By applying this effort, you can expect to increase your capacity to achieve your personal and professional goals and to develop better working relationships with your associates and all of your loved ones. In short, you can expect to become more effective. Let me suggest that the best way to get the most out of the seven habits is to be very open-minded, to be open to self-discovery. Participate, really get involved. Look for ways to apply and to implement these habits in your life. You see, our habits form our character. You may have heard the quote, sow a thought, reap an action. Sow an action, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. For our purposes, we will define a habit as the intersection of knowledge, skill, and desire. You see, knowledge is the theoretical component. That is the what to do and the why to do it. Skill is the practical side of how to do it. And desire is the motivation side, the want to do it. In order to make something a habit in our lives, we literally must have all three components. Habits are powerful factors in our lives. They constantly express our character. They determine the level of our effectiveness or our ineffectiveness. In the words of an English poet, we first make our habits, then our habits make us. The seven habits are simply common sense, common sense organized. But remember, what is common sense is not always common practice. So I encourage you to make the investment. Put forth the time and effort. Focus on the kinds of changes you can make consistently and over time to develop these habits. The development of the seven habits began with a study I completed in 1976. I wanted to study the success idea in America and how it evolved. So I got into the popular success literature going back for 200 years. This included many, many books, magazine articles, annotated bibliographies, summaries, reviews. I literally tapped into thousands and thousands of sources, either directly or indirectly. As I worked, I started to sense a pattern. As soon as I sensed this pattern, I looked for evidence of it, and the evidence was everywhere. The basic finding was this. For the first 150 years, almost the entire focus of the literature was on character, on principles, on what we might call the character ethic. Attributes such as integrity, fidelity, courage, compassion, contribution, responsibility justice. 
These findings became the basis for writing the seven habits of highly effective people. And then, because of many, many societal forces, the emphasis gradually shifted in the early 1900s, particularly in the 20s and the 30s, away from the character ethic to what we might call the personality ethic, which focused more on techniques than on principles. You are probably familiar with many books that illustrate the literature of the personality ethic. They basically deal with how to take care of yourself, how to look good, how to dress in particular ways, how to create the right image. In other words, the personality ethic focuses on how to appear to be rather than on how to actually be. Many of these techniques have real merit. However, if they don't have their roots in the character ethic, if they don't have their roots in principles, they won't have the power to create enduring effectiveness. For example, what if people learn techniques of influencing others, but they're fundamentally duplicitous or deceitful in their character? What if they really wanted to use people to build their own economic success? They might develop smoothness in their relationships so that they can have their own personal ends achieved, money, fame, glory, whatever. They really couldn't care less about contribution or service, purpose, adding value, helping others. How much trust would you have in them? How willing would you be to follow them or to rely upon them when things get tough? You know, one time I had a student come to me and say, how am I doing in your class? I looked him in the eye and said, you really know how you're doing, don't you? A lot better than I do. How are you doing? And he kind of looked down squeamishly. Well, not too good, I guess. I just had kind of a rough time lately, and maybe I haven't applied myself as much as I should have. You really came to find out how well you'd psyched me out, how well you'd psyched out the system, isn't that right? When in fact, you kind of know in your heart how you're doing. Well, how am I doing, he said. How are you doing? Let's focus on what's really happening, not on what's appearing to happen. You see, this whole personality ethic with its technique focus is like the tip of an iceberg. The tip, or that part which is seen on the surface by others, it's above the water. The character ethic is like the great mass of the iceberg under the water. People often do no work in the foundation where the great mass is, where the greatest long-term impact is. Too many people give all their energy and focus to the tip of the iceberg, that is, to learning techniques that others can see. You see this even in organizations, not just individuals. You see programs change, practices change, principles do not change. If we help individuals and organizations to internalize principles, they will know how to adapt the practices to address specific situations. Let me emphasize that techniques have their place. They're very important. I really mean that. I mean, you want good human relations techniques, public relations techniques, communication techniques, management techniques. But when we use techniques to cover our own lack of character, they become manipulative. They undermine trust and confidence. You see, what we really need is the character ethic. And that's essentially what The Seven Habits is about. This material is based on an inside-out approach, meaning we give our first energies to our own character development before we focus on techniques or how to be more effective with others. Gandhi, beautifully demonstrated this principle once. A mother came to him and said, Would you help my child reduce the amount of sugar he is eating? Gandhi paused, thought, and answered, Well, talk to me in a week. A week later, the mother asked him again, and he talked to the boy, and the boy agreed. And the mother said, 
Why didn't you talk with him last week? Gandhi smiled and said, You don't understand. Last week, I too was eating sugar. Unless we work on our character, we will not develop trustworthiness. And trustworthiness is built by the combination of both character and competency. We could have all of the ability in the world, but if we don't have the basic character to be reliable, to take responsibility, others will soon learn to distrust us. They're fearing that we are just trying to meet our own ends, perhaps at their expense. In my opinion, unless we return to the character ethic, we won't have the basic foundation of trustworthiness. That's what leads to trust, which is needed to build effective interpersonal relationships. In the final analysis, what we are communicates far more eloquently than anything we say or do. I love the quote of Henry David Thoreau. For every thousand hacking at the leaves of evil, there is one striking at the root. In other words, let's work primarily on the roots to begin with and build a foundation of trustworthiness. This is one of the key areas of focus in the seven habits, to build character and competence and to restore trustworthiness and trust in our lives, in the lives of our families, our organizations. Trust and trustworthiness really are the basis of personal and interpersonal leadership. It's the foundation of all true effectiveness. Before I go into the habits, I would like to stand back and look at the basic structure, the basic framework of the seven habits as a whole. You see, they're organized in a particular way for a reason. They're all interrelated. In fact, the relationships and the sequence among the habits are the key to their overall power. To help us visualize the sequential and progressive nature of the seven habits, I'd like to use a simple diagram I call the maturity continuum. Maturity refers to a process leading to growth and development, and continuum refers to the continuous, incremental nature of growth and progression. If you were to see a maturity continuum line from low maturity to high maturity, there would be three basic levels to it. The first level is dependence. The second level is independence. And the third and the highest level is interdependence. Let me define these three terms very briefly. Dependence basically means you need others to get what you want. You see, all of us began life as an infant, dependent on others for nurturing and sustenance. I may be intellectually dependent on other people's thinking. I may be emotionally dependent on other people's affirmation and validation of me. Dependence is the attitude of you. You take care of me. You come through for me. Or you don't come through. I blame you for the results. Independence basically means you are pretty much free from the external influence, the control, and the support of others. You think, you act for yourself. You're validated from within. You're interdirected. You're self-reliant. You get what you want through your own effort. Like dependence, it is possible to be independent in various areas, physically, financially, intellectually, emotionally, while not being independent in other areas. Independence is the attitude of I. I can do it. I am responsible. I am self-reliant. I can choose. True independence of character empowers us to act rather than to be acted upon. It frees us from our dependence on circumstances and other people. It is the avowed goal of many individuals and also many social movements to enthrone independence as the highest level of achievement. 
but it is not the ultimate goal in effective living. There is a far more mature, more advanced level. The third and highest level in the maturity continuum is interdependence. If people were interdependent, what would they be? They would be very much like a marriage, a family, an executive team where they need to cooperate together in order to accomplish what I want, what you want, what we want together. In fact, we live in an interdependent reality. Interdependence is essential for good leaders, good team players, for success in marriage, for family life and organizations. Interdependence is the attitude of we. We can cooperate. We can be a team. We can combine our talents, our abilities, our best efforts to achieve our highest success. Now here is the basic insight. Think on this. Until you and I are independent, we cannot be interdependent. Let me say that again. Until you and I are independent, we cannot be interdependent. In other words, we can't do calculus before we understand algebra. We can't run before we learn to walk. We neither can learn to work cooperatively with other people if we don't have internal self-mastery. That's why the first three habits, be proactive, begin with the end in mind, and put first things first, deal with self-mastery, self-control, self-dominion. They form the deepest part of our character. They constitute what I call the private victory, the victory over self. You see, private victories must precede public victories. To lead others effectively, we first must be able to lead ourselves effectively. For example, when I make a commitment to get up early and exercise, and I literally carry it out, I feel better. I feel better about myself. I have greater emotional strength. I have better physical energy. You see what that means? A private victory. As a result, I do better in all my relationships with others. That's the public victory. However, have you ever noticed the tendency to be irritable with others after failing to keep a commitment to yourself? I know, speaking for myself, I can usually trace my weaknesses, my failures in dealing with others to some flaw, some failure to win my own private victory. These first three habits lead us from dependence to independence. Then once people have control over themselves and have a measure of independence, they're ready to deal with the next three habits. Think win-win. Seek first to understand, then to be understood, and synergize, all of which helps us in our relationships with others, enabling us to be successful with people. Habits four, five, and six develop what I call the public victory, effectiveness with others. It's based on teamwork, on cooperation, and communication. Habits four, five, and six utilize our personality. They're more skill-based, and they lead us from independence to interdependence. That is the attitude of we, where we cooperate to accomplish desired results. Then habit seven, sharpen the saw, is the habit of renewal, of regular, balanced renewal in all of the dimensions of our life. It surrounds and encompasses all of the other habits. It is the habit of continuous improvement that creates an upward spiral of growth and development. Now interdependence is a choice that only independent people can make. For instance, let's say you're my supervisor and I'm very dependent upon your opinion of me. I'm also dependent financially and intellectually upon you. But let's say you have some blind spots in your performance and you really need feedback. I'm aware of your blind spots. I also have enough skill to give you feedback. But would I do it? I wouldn't. I'm too dependent upon you. I'm too angry at you. I'm mad because those blind spots hurt me. I have what's often called a love-hate relationship. You see, the person you're dependent upon also controls you. If you don't get what you want, it makes you mad. 
so I wouldn't possibly give you honest feedback. I don't want to rupture my relationship with you. So what do I do? I talk to others. And then they share their experiences, and they validate me, and we badmouth you. We're simply not interdependent. If I were truly interdependent, that means if I'm first of all independent, I could go to you and I could say, could we have a visit? I would like to share some of my concerns. But if you were dependent yourself and used to borrowing strength from your position power, you might try to intimidate me. You might say, well, what is it, Stephen? Let's get to it right now. What are your concerns? On the other hand, if I'm emotionally and intellectually independent from you, I could be courageous and kind at the same time. I'm patient. I don't give up, but I don't give in. I could say, we need a little more time where we're not going to be interrupted. Let's do it at our mutual convenience. You would sense that you're dealing with a person of integrity, of power, of strength, of courage. You would also know from my professional development opportunities and the way I have exercised them, I've got about 10 other jobs I could go to at any time. You probably also know I'm the only one in your crew that isn't badmouthing you. I have no need to badmouth. I have no energy around your weaknesses. I don't want to do something to hurt you. I don't want to do something to help you, to overcome your weaknesses, or perhaps help you compensate for the deficiency in some way. So I'm most positive person on your entire team. I'm almost, almost indispensable to you. Now the first three habits develop that kind of strength, courage, and capacity. The next three habits help me know how to work effectively with you so that my strength does not intimidate you. I can empathize with you. I can read the needs of the situation and figure out the best way to make the presentation so that the two of us can cooperate together and solve the problem. You would see me as the best source of problem solving on your entire team. Interdependence is where real freedom is. That's where excitement is. That's where adventure is. Their very best comes to the fore. That's the maturity continuum, the adventure of building powerful, interdependent relationships, interdependent teams. I'm going to attempt to give a brief overview of each of the habits. It's like getting a kind of airplane view of the whole mountain range before we go down to explore the detail. Habit one, be proactive, basically means that your life is a product of your values, not your feelings that your life or the organization's life is a product of your decisions, not your conditions. The opposite of being proactive is to be reactive, which basically means that your life is a function of your feelings, your moods, your impulses, other people's treatment. The underlying principle of habit one, be proactive, is to take responsibility. The concept is you and I have the capacity to choose our response. Habit two, begin with the end in mind, basically means that all things are created twice. And habit two is the first creation. Habit two, begin with the end in mind, means that you get a mental image, a picture, of where you want to end up in this meeting, in this relationship, this year, in your life. To a company, it is the vision it has of its future. It is the creation of that vision. Habit two, 
is based on the principle of vision, of purpose, of meaning, of mission. Habit three, to put first things first, is the second creation. To put first things first means you decided what the first things were in habit two, now you have the discipline and the commitment to keep them first. The opposite of putting first things first is to put second or third or fourth things first. That's why many people really deeply value their family relationships, their health, their personal integrity. But they get caught up in the powerful social value systems, timetables and agendas of their culture. Never question it so that the first creation has already been done for them, done to them in the form of programs, scripts that they never question. Then they get on this ladder of success and they arrive at the top rung only then to realize the ladder is leaning against the wrong wall. They come to realize that no one on their deathbed ever wished they'd spent more time at the office. <laughs> As Goethe put it, things which matter most must never be at the mercy of things which matter least. Habit four, think win-win, is the habit of mutual benefit. The underlying paradigm or principle is abundance. There is plenty out there and to spare. So you don't have to be threatened by the strengths of other people. You can nurture competency around you higher than your own. It doesn't threaten you. You can share knowledge. You can share recognition, gain, profit. The opposite is scarcity, not abundance. It's like a piece of pie. There's only so much. If you get the recognition, I may not get it. If I share gain or profit with you, I, we will have less. Habit four to think win-win comes from the principle of abundance, not scarcity, meaning the pie gets larger and larger and larger. Habit five, seek first to understand, then to be understood, is the habit of empathic communication, meaning you always seek to understand first. The teacher diagnoses, pre-assesses before teaching. The doctor diagnoses before prescribing. The attorney does discovery before developing his or her own case or brief. Understand first before you seek to be understood, before you seek to contribute, before you take action, before you have the basis for judgment. Habit six, synergize, is the habit of creative cooperation. Seeking to understand. We create something that was not there before. That takes high levels of cooperation. The principle behind habit six is the principle that one plus one can equal three, four, ten, twenty, a thousand. It's the principle of putting two boards together that are stronger in total than adding the sum of the boards separate. It's the principle of valuing differences, not tolerating differences, not accepting differences, celebrating differences. Habit seven is called sharpen the saw. It is the principle of renewal, the principle of continuous learning, continuous improvement, getting better constantly. It's based on the principle that we have the capability of charging our own battery. The opposite of habit seven, sharpen the saw, is to just let the blade get dull, to let the mind atrophy, to let the body lose its tone and its vitality through junk food and no exercise and trying to live a life of hedonism, pleasure-seeking, rather than one of contribution and service. 
it renews each of the other six habits. Now, simply, the three-person process is this. The best way to learn something is to teach it. How many have learned that? How many have learned that when you really teach is when you really learn? In five minutes, you will be teaching what I'm teaching you in the next five minutes. See yourself now as a teacher. I'm going to briefly describe the three-person process and the four benefits that come from the three-person process. Now, notice your behavior right now. <laughs> see, you don't see yourself as a kind of passive learner. You see yourself as an active teacher. You're just preparing to teach. And that significantly increases your learning. That is the first benefit. The first person teaches. The second person first captures, understands, then evaluates to see if it makes sense, thinks about application, and then teaches the third person. Then that person teaches another person. This way you can take material and cascade it through an entire organization. Second benefit. When you teach, you significantly increase the likelihood of application. For instance, if you're teaching people to be better listeners, isn't it probable that you'll try to be a better listener yourself? See, the real most foundational learning comes from doing. Teaching may give you more intellectual understanding, but the internalization of the ideas comes in the application of those ideas. That's even a higher level of learning. Third benefit. When you teach, you significantly improve communication. Notice the three-person process there. Why do you think communication would be significantly improved? Notice the first person teaches. And what does the second person do? First captures or understands before evaluating. What is the number one obstacle in the field of communication? People do not listen. They do not capture accurately. They evaluate while they're listening. But if people are trained to capture accurately, completely, before they judge, you can listen for purpose, main points, how each point is proven or validated, how each point is illustrated or applied, and value. The fourth benefit. When these things happen I'm talking about, it is very bonding to the relationship. The relationship gets steeper and stronger. Why? There's so much authenticity. There's so much sincerity. There is so much empathy and creativity being manifested in the communication processes. When you do this with your children, you will learn better. The next time you send somebody to a convention, to some training activity, to some association meeting. Before they go, what do you say to them? When you return, you will have the privilege of distilling the essence of what you learned to the assembled staff for half an hour. You'll find they'll attend the meeting. Sober. <laughs> they'll take notes. From the moment you give that assignment, they will be in sweat city. Seriously, they'll go to work. All eight cylinders will go to work. It's the single most powerful thing I have ever learned in the field of education. 
Use the three-person process and you will double, quadruple the impact and you will see those four benefits happen. It's the essence of the process that we use, the three-person process. When we get into the seven habits material, we have to realize that it is all based upon principles, upon natural laws. That is why we are presenting this foundational material first. We need to understand the concept of a principle and the concept of a paradigm and also how to define effectiveness. Then we'll look at the seven habits. I suggest that principles are not only natural laws, objective, factual, external to ourself. I suggest they are also self-evident. How would we know that? We have found that if you can get enough people interacting freely and synergistically who are informed, all the value systems are the same. We find that regardless of one's background, religion, culture, nationality, race, gender, regardless of the level in the organization, regardless of the industry or the profession, the same underlying values are universal. They represent what we could call principles. There is consensus that surrounds them, such as integrity, service, contribution, the growth and development of people, kindness, how you treat people, dignity, fairness. These are universals. Every one of the habits represents a principle, a fundamental natural law that is self-evident. Now, let me just give an illustration of the difference between a social value and principles. It was a dark and stormy night. Captain! Captain! Captain, wake up! Uh, what is it? Sorry to awaken you, sir, but we have a serious problem. And we've tried to solve it and can't. What's the problem? There's a ship in our sea lane about 20 miles away that refuses to move. Well, what do you mean they refuse? Just tell them to move. We have, sir. That's the problem. They won't respond. I'll tell them. The signal goes out. Move starboard 20 degrees. The signal comes back. Move starboard 20 degrees yourself. <laughs> what arrogance. <laughs> who is this guy? He doesn't know who I am. Let him know a captain is giving the command. The signal goes out. This is Captain Horatio Hornblower, the 16th. Move starboard 20 degrees at once. The Cindy comes back. This is Seaman Carl Jones, the third. Move starboard 20 degrees at once yourself. This is a command. A seaman commanding me, a captain. I can't believe this. What is going on? Let them know who I am. We're a battleship. We could just blow them up. The Cindy goes out. This is the mighty Missouri, flagship of the Seventh Fleet. Signal returns. This is the lighthouse. <laughs> <laughs> you see, lighthouses are like principles. We don't break them. We break ourselves against them. This is why humility is the mother of all other virtues. Openness, teachability, Humility, 
awareness of external realities. If you can cultivate that and apply it with other people, you'll change the whole nature of the culture. It'll become a principle-centered culture, not one driven by social values. I had a friend of mine who said, our company is value-driven. I said, every company is value-driven. Hitler was value-driven. The question is, are the values in alignment with principles? That is a humbling question. Or are my values and my habits in alignment with principles, with natural laws? Now, when principles and values are aligned, then you could use the words interchangeably. You could call it values or principles, it would make no difference. So you don't want to get hung up semantically on the difference. But if, if they are not aligned, then it's better to see what the principle is and what the established value is and then work here to align it. It's constantly an effort to understand principles the law of gravity. Gradually, the whole world has come to accept that. The apple falling out of the tree and hitting the scientist's head. Simple observation. The law of gravity governs. What if you had a legislature trying to repeal the law of gravity? <laughs> a principle is the actual reality like the law of gravity, the way things are. How many here, when you were in school, did a lot of cramming? Be honest now. How many got really good at it? How many here have ever worked on the farm? Ever cram on the farm? I don't mean just work hard at the end to bring in the harvest. I mean, Forget the plant in the spring, flake off all summer, and then really work hard in the end to bring in a harvest. <laughs> well, it's patently foolish, we know that. Why? Because a farm is a natural system and is governed by what? Principles or social values? Principles. What about the development of our mind? What would you say? Social values or principles? the development of the mind, not the getting of a degree. You can't fake it. The development of the mind is based on principles, the law, the harvest, not on social values, however popular. What about the body? What would you say? Social values or principles? Our health, physical, mental, spiritual, emotional, is governed by the law of the harvest, by principles not by social values. Now let's have just a little fun for a second. He looks strong and healthy and I'm sure he'll pass the test. Okay, now what we want are 20 straight back push-ups. If you get into the push-up position, please. Okay. All right, we're gonna cheer you on. We're gonna count for you too. There's some army guys back there. <laughs> Now those people are uh, keeping the peace. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and start. We'll count and cheer you on. How many am I doing? Just 20, straight back. All the way down.
<laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no purpose, just a little fun. <laughs> I sat next to him at lunch, and uh, we looked at this cheesecake out in front. I ate it. You ate it? <laughs> Told you you'd live with the consequences. <laughs> Everything that I've been talking about is not easily achievable. It takes continuous effort. You can't fake, for instance, the ability to do 20 push-ups. You can't fake it. You have to pay the price. Next time I come back, he literally, I'm convinced, could do 25, even 50. But he'd have to pay a price to do it. It stirs up an awareness that we're dealing with realities out there particularly principles that ultimately will govern. We are not in control. See, the traditional concept is get in control. We are not in control. Principles control. We control our actions, but the consequences that flow from those actions are controlled by principles. As Abraham Lincoln once put it, people will pass away, but principles never will. They endure. This is why we believe so much in the Eastern statement, give a man a fish, you feed him for the day, teach him how to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. See, even though you may teach someone a practice, always try to teach the principle which underlies it, because the situation may change and the practice no longer applies. But the principle will be constant. Principles are universal natural laws, self-evident, self-validating, they govern, ultimately. Values don't govern. Principles ultimately govern. There's an old saying among potato growers is that uh, a good rotation is a thousand years of sagebrush and uh, one year of potatoes. And whereas that's not possible, obviously, then we do next best, and that is uh, spend the, the time and the number of years we need to to prepare that ground so that when we do plant a potato crop, which is very expensive to grow, we know then that uh, we've given it every chance to succeed and have a premium quality potato. We recognize that there's a brotherhood of sorts among, among growers of potatoes. On the other hand, uh, we also recognize the fact that we're uh, in total competition one with another, and that those people who buy our products uh, examine virtually every potato storage and try to select the, the premium quality potatoes. In the potato industry, people are willing to pay for a premium potato, but uh, a poor quality potato is uh, really unmarketable. So it's a very serious consideration that we take the time to prepare for that potato crop. And so what we do is uh, spend anywhere from two to three or four years preparing the ground prior to planting the potatoes. And this, is, this crop is one of them. It's a wheat crop and it's uh, not a lucrative crop, but it's a very good crop to prepare for the potato crop that's yet to come. All the preparations we can make uh, almost uh, daily, uh, we do in order to assure quality. And uh, we have to work hard at it. Otherwise, we have a, a product that no one wants to buy. One of the things that we've learned over the years, and I'm not young anymore, is the fact that uh, Mother Nature is terribly unforgiving. And if we violate her rules, then she's very severe. And uh, those who try to cheat her and uh, ask for leniency are the ones who ultimately fail. Some years she may give us a little break, but if you count on it, you're a fool. You, you count only on your ability to get the crop out uh, 
before Mother Nature is going to come and take it from you. The temptation to, uh, to do things easier, quicker, is sometimes there, but we've learned that we can't do it. We have to put the time and effort and money into to having machinery and people prepared and make the sacrifices that's necessary to get it done in that time frame. We have three or four years of preparation for one crop of potatoes, and then we have a window of three weeks to get that crop out of the ground and under cover before Mother Nature plays tricks on us. We try to maximize our uh, growing season by waiting as long as we dare, but we also know that uh, we're tickling the dragon's tail, so to speak, and so we make every preparation we can to let the crop grow as long as we can, and then once that's over, and then we get into harvest, it's uh, terribly important that we go not night and day, but 18 hours a day in order to beat that potential cold that could destroy the crop even though it's in the ground. It's a pretty tough schedule and pretty important that we're fully prepared and competent and, and, uh, and get the job done timely or we could lose it. F virtually three or four years of work. In this business, we've learned uh, some lessons and some, some of them in a hard way that we can't uh, take shortcuts or try to cheat as it relates to a harvest time. All the advances we see in irrigation, in equipment, uh, in technology, in seed, in fertilization uh, is not a substitute for other things. Anytime we violate uh, the law of the harvest, so to speak, then we're doomed to failure in spite of all the the advancements that we see come along. We try to make the best use we can of uh, new technology and equipment that fits our needs, but we have also learned that it is no substitute for good, sound decision-making and preparation, which we've always relied on, and, and, and we will always rely on it. It's more fundamental than changes in technology and equipment. I sense sometimes that there's a, a growing mentality in this country and maybe in the world that great things are going to be accomplished through advancements in technology and communications and computers to the point that the human element is not important and I think nothing could be further from the truth that uh, we succeed only to the point that we develop the ability to change with changing times, to be prepared to resist the temptation to make shortcuts in our own preparation and uh, knowledge. And uh, I think the moment we rely on technology to substitute, we make grave mistakes. By the very nature of farming, we have no roof over our head. We take whatever Mother Nature gives to us. We can't store good weather. We have to use it when it's good. We can't control the elements. We like the life. We think it builds character in people. Paradigm comes from the Greek root paradigma. It basically means a pattern, a model, a representation, something that stands for something else. It comes from the mental image you have in your mind of the way things are out there. And the images we carry in our heads of the way things are, of reality, come basically from our own backgrounds, our own experiences. All of us think we see the world as it is. In fact, we see the world as we are. We project 
onto the outside world, our environment, the people we associate with, including how we see ourselves, we project out of our own conditioning experiences, our background, a certain representation, a certain model, a certain set of expectations, a certain assumption on that reality out there. And we think that's the way it is. I might describe myself or you or a situation as if I am describing it as it is. In fact, I am describing myself, that is, my perceptions, my frame of reference, my worldview, my value system, my autobiography. And I'm projecting it upon the outside. Now let me give a very simple layman's way of looking at a paradigm. It is a map, like a map of this hotel, or a map, let's say, of Portland. I'll ask this gentleman. <laughs> What would you do if you came here to Portland and you have no information at all about this place and you were given a map where you rented the car and it was a map of Seattle <laughs> but on the top it said Portland. What would you do? So you don't know otherwise. Never been here, you have no other source of information hopefully ask for a little bit more direction other than just what's on that map. Maybe have them start me out. Okay, the person at the desk said, sorry, sir, that's all we have, and it's late at night. Good luck to you. Here's the keys to your car. It's right across the street. It's in number 14. And if you follow this map, you'll be able to find this hotel that you want to get to. Okay, now just assume that you call your buddy here up on the phone, and he knows that you've got that map, and he says to you, what's your first name? Keith. Keith, try harder. You're tired. <laughs> <laughs> so now you double your speed. What's going to happen? I'm going to get nowhere twice as fast. <laughs> <laughs> you call him back in a state of total despair and discouragement. And you say to him, I have never been so confused and so lost in my life. And I am following this map to the hill. And I have doubled my speed. I'm lost twice as fast. He senses you're discouraged. You're really down. You're almost ready to give up. It's despairing. And he says to you, think positively. <laughs> <laughs> he gets you just jazzed right out of your gourd. I mean, he says, you can do this thing. Rise to the occasion. Do it. I do it. That'll do it. <laughs> now you don't even care you're lost, right? That's right. I'm a, I'm a happy lost. <laughs> That's what a paradigm is. You see, a paradigm is the map you have in your mind. Once you have an accurate map, then your behavior and your attitude matter. See, what we call maps are usually assumptions. Assumptions of the way things are. Assumptions of the way things are represent just that's what reality is. You don't question that. I remember I was giving a speech a little while back and uh, there was someone on the front row just constantly talking to another person. And my mother was two rows behind and she was so upset that here her precious son was being so ignored so blatantly, so openly, constantly, and would not end. From the very moment I began to the end of my speech, just constant talking. And it just totally discombobulated her own listening and she felt like taking her purse and reaching two rows ahead. <laughs> Anyway, she went up afterwards to the person that was running the conference and did you see that? Did you see what was happening? Can you believe that right there on the front row that 
Yeah, I know. She's Korean. That's her translator. <laughs> I was on a subway, very, very large metropolitan city. Sunday morning, it was quiet, sedate. Bunch of young kids run into the subway. Father follows. He sits near me. The kids just go crazy on that subway, running up and down, turning people's papers aside, just raucous and rude. I'm sitting there. Oh, I can't believe this. He does nothing. I look at my attitude, see? Attitude. I try to control. But look what I could see. After a few minutes, attitude went into behavior. Sir, do you think you could control your children a little? They're very upsetting to people. Oh, yeah. He lifted his head as if to come to an awareness of what was happening. Yeah. I don't know. I just guess I should. Uh, we just left the hospital. Their mother died just about an hour ago. And I guess they don't know how to take it. And frankly, I don't either. Imagine the paradigm shift that took place there. Imagine now what the attitude and the behavior would be based upon that paradigm. Can you see why paradigms are deeper than attitude or behavior? And you know, even though we're talking here in personal and interpersonal ways, the same thing takes place throughout our whole society. Thomas Kuhn, in his brilliant book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, points out so powerfully and consistently all of the significant breakthroughs were breakwiths, old ways of thinking. Einstein, who rewrote physics, he made this brilliant statement. The significant problems we face cannot be solved at the same level of thinking we were at when we created them. You see, it causes us to be reflective and introspective to explore our own paradigms. Most people focus upon behavior and upon attitude. And both of those are, of course, very important. But far more fundamental than either behavior or attitude is a paradigm. ever been to uh, the crazy mirror room in the carnival? Well, what if that was the only source of information you had on your body? <laughs> this weird caricature. I mean, it showed me without any hair, if you can believe it. <laughs> See, most people's self-maps are a function of the social mirror. They live out of the social mirror and their memory. A mother the other day said to me, I cannot believe my child. All of a sudden, she turns 17, and she's like a different person. I have never seen anyone so uncooperative, so rebellious, so angry, so unwilling to do anything to help us at home or to even be open to influence at all. Now, what is happening to the map or the paradigm in her head? And what do you do when you have that? You act upon it. That is the image that you have in your head of this person. It's the map you have of this person. Now, someone could say to you, just as I did here, Try harder. Try to be more positive. But as long as a person carries that map, that image of this other person in their head, they're going to treat them that way. As soon as they treat them that way, the tendency is for people to respond accordingly. 
It's called the self-fulfilling prophecy. People live up to the social mirror that surrounds them. Now, I said to this mother, notice how you see your daughter. Well, it's not how I see her, it's the way she is. Potentially, is she capable of so much more? Oh yes, I know that. Why don't you see her in terms of her potential? Is not her potential part of the reality of her life? Isn't it really the larger part? Where the present manifestation, as she goes through, say, the emotional ups and downs of her teenage so-called identity crisis, you could live out of your imagination. And out of a map, a paradigm, a view based upon her potential, which you deeply really believe in. Yeah, but what do I do with all this behavior and the totally unwillingness to cooperate, to do her part? Observe your paradigm. Observe the map you have of her. I remember I was in a situation like that. One of our teenage sons, just between the grade school and junior high, was just not performing. He wasn't adequate in any area. Athletically, people would fall apart with laughter, watching. You know, almost swinging the bat before the ball was pitched. Academically, not only wouldn't do well on tests, couldn't even begin to take them. Socially, sometimes very embarrassing. Now look, look at the evidence we have. And Sandra and I, my wife, would talk about this. Well, maybe every family deserves their one. <laughs> but we cared about this boy, and we were very worried. And I remember one time talking about the same subject in Armonk, New York. And I was talking about a study which opened up the whole field of what's called the self-fulfilling prophecy, where a computer in England called the Bright Group, dumb, essentially. Here's the teachers. It's the Bright Group over here. You've got 120, 130 IQ. They love education. They love learning. You'll really enjoy them. This group here, you can kind of tell when you just look at their faces. <laughs> this group, they're very fine people too. But they don't have the same candle power and you have to respect that. Now notice what's happening. I'm talking as if I'm describing reality, right? This is the way they are. And they buy it. And they act on it for a period of several months. In other words, it becomes their view, their paradigm. But you know what? Several months later, they discovered there was a computer mistake of some kind, and the two groups were switched. They immediately tested, without telling anything to anybody. This group here went up something like 18 points. This group went down 14 points. The self-fulfilling prophecy. Our self-maps, our self-paradigms, so much a function of the social mirror. A reversal based upon expectancy, paradigms, the mental representation, the maps held by these people. That is the significance of paradigms. And you notice how behavior and attitude flow out of how you see. Well, anyway, I was literally teaching this like I'm teaching you right now. And in my mind, I was thinking of my boy. Is it possible that the problem is in my paradigm? That the problem is with me, not my boy? Well, I talked with my wife when I returned home from that trip, and I said, you know, I'm just wondering if 
the social mirror from you and I are not major contributors to these difficulties and these problems, this lack of ability to cope. We found that we were to some degree trying to get social mileage out of our kids' good behavior. See, that was part of our motive of what people thought of us about our children. We liked the way they would speak well of us because of the performance of our children. We worried what would happen if they didn't live up to it. We see what we seek. So we explored our motives and said, this is not what we seek. We began to see him differently. As a person precious in his own right, not to be compared with anyone else, not to get into the social mirror of comparison against timetable, social agenda. He could easily be a late bloomer with tremendous potentialities that does not test out well in some areas. We don't know. It's just a whole big area of potential. And we were trying to put labels upon it. You see what I mean by the tendency is to project out of our own experiences like a home movie, to project it onto someone else and to label. But we never explored our own motive. We never became reflective and introspective. Things were going well with the others, but all of a sudden, something threw us out of our standard operating procedure, and we couldn't just easily gloss over by psyching them up with PMA stuff. Come on, think positively, you know. Keep your eye on the ball when it comes now. All right, now, and then you swing. That's okay, son, don't worry about it. Get off his back, you know. You made mistakes. Okay, uh, you're all fine, son. Then privately we talk with each other, see. Oh, what have we got here? <laughs> Duplicitous, unprincipled, as if he had no intrinsic merit and worth. That was the hardest part of the therapy was dealing with self, exploring our own paradigms, loosening them up. But when you try to have people, to possess them, to own them, and to have their performance reflect on your reputation, your basic motive structure drives the paradigm of how you see that person, because you'll see them through this social mirror frame of reference. And then you get into the self-fulfilling prophecy. Hopefully, our humility a willingness to surface the assumptions we make about life and to challenge them has been stirred up. Particularly when it comes to our maps of ourself, of our loved ones, of our boss, of our work associates, of other people. And then, out of that humility, to say to the other person, how do you see it? What is your view? What is your perspective? What is your frame of reference? What is your opinion? And you constantly get a better, better sense of the way things are. You get a better and better paradigm. Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Highly effective. Not mediocre effectiveness. Not low-level effectiveness. High effectiveness. Quantum leaps in effectiveness. What do we mean by effectiveness? What is effectiveness? We could use the word success, you know, but that word carries so much of the old social value connotation of having it all. That's why we use the word effectiveness. Seven habits of highly effective people. You know about Aesop and his famous tales about this poor farmer, you know, really down on his luck. And the farmer visits his favorite goose and he notices 
one day, there is a large egg, a golden egg, by the side of that goose. He thinks someone has tricked him, so he throws it away. Second thought, he decides to test it and finds out, indeed, it is pure gold. Pure gold, and he's been so poor for so long. And the next day, another one. And the next day, another one. Every day, there's another golden egg. He becomes so wealthy, so fabulously wealthy, but he also becomes very impatient and very greedy. He wants them all. He wants them all now. So he kills that goose, reaches inside to get them all, and of course finds none. Now, in that little fable is the essence of the definition of effectiveness. It's made up basically of two things. Getting what you want, and second, getting what you want in a way that enables you to get what you want again, and again, and again. We call it the PPC balance. P stands for production of desired results. PC stands for production capability. In other words, the capability of the asset to continue to produce the results. You can apply this to any field of human endeavor. Any field. How many here have had a PPC imbalance with regard to the way you take care of your physical assets? Your car, your lawnmower. How many sometimes just run that over and over and not properly maintain? How many have had that experience? Why? It takes time to give attention, time and money to attend to PC, production capability. And people who are in a rush and who want what they want now, they'll go ahead and just run that machine or that car with no thought to its maintenance, really. No PC attention at all. Eventually, no more golden eggs. The goose dies. Let me ask you what you would do if you were in a situation inside a company. You're in charge of this machine. The machine is producing well. And you want to really impress those people upstairs with the way you can produce. And there's very quick upward mobility. So you're really only interested in short-term production results. What would you do with that machine? Put it into high gear. High gear. Run it all the time run it all the time, no PC, no maintenance. Why? That's downtime. That's costs. Just keep that baby running constantly. More and more and more golden eggs. Now you're promoted because there is such quick upward mobility. The growth is just enormous in that organization. Then the next new manager of the machine comes on the scene. By this time, the machine is broken down because of no PC. So he's got to do PC work, maintenance work, repair work. So his costs go like this, and his production goes like this. My cost went like this, and my production went like that. I wrote black ink, he wrote red ink. So what do we say about my successor? Um, yeah, what a, what a loser, really. I mean, while you were there, Profitable. As soon as you left, unprofitable. What about our bodies? How many here have the regular practice of a good exercise program? How many know you should? <laughs> well, ultimately, what will happen? Immune system could be weakened, make you vulnerable to all kinds of other diseases. What about the mind? What about the development of the mind? Constant learning. You can become so obsolete so fast if you don't pay the price on a daily basis to stay abreast of your own field and at least some working conceptual knowledge of how that relates to the other fields out there. 
Can you see why effectiveness with one's self, with body, mind, and spirit is a PPC balance? With any physical assets, with even financial assets? How many have gone for the golden eggs from time to time in your life where you started to spend the principal instead of the interest? How many have ever done that? That is, you want to live a little higher on the hog, so you dip into the principal, the fund, see, the investment, rather than living on the interest, so that you can have more of what you want now. The whole idea of denying yourself, of subordinating it, of the discipline it takes to save before you spend, instead of to spend and then be forced to save, and that can then be a seedbed to other human interaction problems or to in-law problems or any other tender sensitive areas. That's when you start to realize the goose has died or is dying. It's sick. The same thing in a marriage relationship. You may have a situation like I saw a while back with the Young Presidents Organization and their families. Very successful person went from nothing to worth hundreds of millions of dollars and had a totally bankrupt family. And the question was asked, was this person truly successful? To use our language, effective. Well, in the business sense, maybe you'd say yes. But in the total sense, in terms of what really matters on one's deathbed, you'd probably say no. PC production capability was utterly neglected in the marriage or in the family. Can you see why effectiveness at home is a PPC balance? What about business? What happens when you neglect the PC of business? Say with a customer. Think. You lose that customer. Okay. Lose that customer. That customer is going to tell others, and then you're going to lose everyone that uh, she or he has influence over. That's why you cannot afford to lose a customer. Without any question, the most powerful advertising is word of mouth. People just accept it like that. That doesn't mean that you just give the customer everything. It means that you try to create a win-win situation so that on balance, what the customer wants and your capacity to keep producing for that customer, your PC, is in alignment and they're balanced together. I remember a clam chatter house that literally was so popular that you could hardly get near the place from about 11 o'clock in the morning till 2 o'clock. People would not only buy it for their lunch, they would buy a big bucket of it for their dinner and take it home. It was so good. It was just so popular. New management came in. No one knew about the change of management. Same name and everything else, but they watered down the clam chowder. Now, the bottom line, guess what happened for a month or so? It just zoomed like this. Why? They save all that cost all that expense and the quality put into the clam chowder. But eventually, it liquidated the loyalty of their customer base. Liquidated it. Little by little, the goose died. They tried to recover it, but by that time, there was a violation that had taken place with the public. Many would not even go back. They didn't trust him anymore. They wouldn't even believe those who said it was the same clam chowder as before. They felt violated. It's so often the case in human organizations that you can liquidate human resources by practices that focus on desired results, production of desired results, but neglects production capability. What about the employee who serves the customer? How can you neglect the PC with that person? Cut out training, cut out institutional advertising, cut out research and development, any form of people development. I mean, you can just about double, quadruple the bottom line of any organization you want by cutting out PC. 
And for a quarter or two, what's it going to look like? Look at the golden egg just absolutely raking in. Always treat your people exactly as you want them to treat your finest customers. And they will. In most cases, they will. It's a fundamental principle of PC in business. Focus on every stakeholder and ask, how well is the relationship with this stakeholder sustaining the capacity to produce what we want from that stakeholder, whether it be a supplier, the community, the environment out there, distributors, dealers, as well as the obvious stakeholders of customers, owners, and employees. You really have to ask that question. The ultimate PPC balance is to fight to increase the economic well-being and quality of life of all stakeholders. You neglect one stakeholder, it will have a negative domino effect upon all the rest. That's why this PPC balance is so foundational. Now I'd like to introduce you to a concept called the emotional bank account. You know what a financial bank account is. If you were my banker and I were to make many, many deposits into this bank account, it would gradually get larger and larger. I could even take withdrawals from it, but I have great reserve capacity. An emotional bank account is like that as well. You could make many, many deposits over a period of time which would build my reserve capacity with you. If I make a mistake, that is a small withdrawal. And the trust is so high, I still have a huge reserve capacity. If I make a huge mistake that violates, in a, the deepest sense, our agreement, it may cause the emotional bank account to be overdrawn all at one time, see? The concept of the emotional bank account is the production capability side of human relationships, of human interaction. Now, any metaphor, if pushed far enough, will tend to break down, including this one. You don't make deposits in order to take withdrawals. Nevertheless, if you have a high emotional bank account, if the quality of that relationship is so good and the trust is so high, you can, in fact, make mistakes. You can take withdrawals. Not on purpose, but often unwittingly, unknowingly, because of insensitivity or whatever. But people understand, just to illustrate. How many have a high emotional bank account with somebody a trust relationship with someone, think of that person, that it is so high you can communicate with them almost without words. Can you think of people? How many have such a high emotional bank account that you can even make mistakes in your communication and they'll still get your meaning? Why? They know your heart. They know what you represent. Now the opposite. How many have a relationship with someone that is really strained, where the trust isn't there, where the emotional bank account is overdrawn? How many have had that in your life or now have one of those in your life? Now what happens when you communicate? What happens when you are very clear in your communication? It won't take. They're always looking for the hidden agendas. They're reading between the lines. What's going on here, really? And if you make a small mistake, boy, that thing can be blown all out of proportion. Talk about drowning in a puddle. Talk about exacerbating some small little weakness into a major character flaw or something like that. 
What originally began as just simple misunderstandings are exacerbated until they become major communication breakdowns. Some people even call them personality conflicts. I was doing a seminar one time on the Oregon coastline. It was so beautiful that we actually held our meetings outside. People just wanted to be immersed in this nature. A lovely day, it was warm. One man came up to me afterwards and said, oh boy, I wish I could enjoy these things that I just can't. What's the problem? Well, I don't know, my wife just grills me like you can't believe. I mean, she just doesn't trust me and she constantly, uh, you know, examines every part of my life. Where have you been? What did you do? Who did you go with? What did you do tonight? Who'd you go to dinner with? And who can I call to check up on all this? And then we talked a little while and then he said, of course, I guess she has good reason for all these misgivings. I mean, I met her when I was on one of these trips when I was married to someone else. <laughs> and I remember saying to him, you cannot talk yourself out of problems you behave yourself into. There is no shortcut. There is no quick fix. The law of the harvest governs. Let me share with you a few examples of deposits and withdrawals into the emotional bank account. The first and most important deposit, kindness and courtesy. The opposite, of course, would be unkindness and discourtesy. A second deposit, make and keep promises. The opposite of that is don't make promises or make them and break them. To make and keep a promise essentially lets the other person know you can be counted upon. You're dependable. You will come through. There is no ability like dependability. You gave your word, you kept it. The circumstances changed, you kept it. The mood changed, you kept it. You come through. If the circumstances change to the point that it would be unwise to keep that promise, you immediately communicate and get them to understand those new circumstances so that they will relieve you of the promise. Be very careful before you ever make a promise. Particularly if it's about a promise dealing with something that's terribly important to another, that is of jugular importance. Be very careful. The withdrawal is not to make any promises at all, though, because you create no hope. That is a withdrawal as well. Not as big, though, as making one in order to placate someone, to kind of have them be satisfied right now, and then to break it downstream because your mood has changed or the circumstances have altered or you just don't want to keep it and you just made it because you wanted to please them at the time. Insecure people make promises freely and quickly all of the time. Another very powerful deposit is the way that you manage expectations. You want to make sure that expectations are clear and unambiguous. Some people, particularly if they're rather immature and insecure, will read an expectation as a promise. So you have to be very explicit to manage expectations. If you sense that people implicitly are projecting expectations upon you, sometimes you have to say, let me clarify the expectations so that people are at peace. The withdrawal is to have unclear expectations, unidentified expectations, ambiguous expectations, unacknowledged expectations that lie implicit inside people. 
Our frustrations are a product of our expectations, and we control our expectations. Therefore, we indirectly control our frustration or our satisfaction. Another extremely powerful deposit strikes at such a deep tendency that many of us have, having to do with being a judge. I call this deposit loyalty to the absent. The withdrawal, of course, would be disloyalty and duplicity. Always be loyal to those who are not present. Speak about them as if they were present. If you're critical, the spirit is one of constructive criticism, one of helpfulness or understanding. You see, the moment the two of us sit and badmouth our supervisor here, what do you know I'm doing when there's a strain on our relationship? What am I doing? What do you think I'm doing? Well, if there's a strain in our relationship and I'm talking to him about you, what am I doing? Doing the same thing. Exactly. That he and I did about him. I see. You see, it is not principle centered. He knows it. He knows my tendency. So that when we speak about the one who is absent in a way that would show respect for him, even if we're critical of him, but in a constructive, positive way, what does he know I'm saying when visiting with him? who is critical of him, that I would do the same thing. In other words, if you want to retain those who are present, be loyal to those who are absent. Now when the sun is shining and you sit and kind of badmouth somebody, it kind of unites you, doesn't it? Kind of cements your relationship because see you have a common enemy, as it were, or someone that you both agree on and you can tear into, see, kind of unite you and you look for evidence and then you have breaks and talk about the person and maybe even have lunch over that person's sins and share each other's stories. <laughs> Make your mind up. And if you're into team building, if you're into culture building, if you're into family building, make a commitment, everybody. If there's any difficulty, with another person, what do you do? Go directly to the person. You don't talk behind their back. I was failing this one time, complaining to the university president of a university that I was a visiting professor of such a bad housing situation, contrary to our agreement and expectation. And I was really cutting into the guy his competency. And the president said, Stephen, I'm so sorry to hear about this housing situation you're in. The housing director is such a fine, competent person. Why don't we have him come on over here and we'll solve the problem together? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I, I don't want to be involved. See, I didn't say that because that would be obviously so irresponsible. But, oh, that's how I felt inside. Oh, I don't want to talk to him. I want to talk about him. <laughs> this president, he just was matter-of-fact and pleasant. And as the gentleman was coming across campus to the president's office, I was going through this internal dialogue. Oh, what have I got myself into now? I'm probably responsible for part of the miscommunication. Maybe we got what was agreed. I don't know what the situation is. Honestly, I was so humbled. By the time he arrived there, you know, how are you? Good to see you. The president could see my duplicity. I mean, 10 minutes before, what incompetence. There's just no carry through with the original commitment. Then, how are you? <laughs> A double-minded person is unstable in all his ways. Duplicity. Another major deposit 
if you blow any of the above, learn to apologize. The withdrawal is pride. Learn to apologize. I was wrong. That was unkind. I saw my son the other day cutting into his little sister for cleaning up his desk. He had it all organized to do his project. It took him a long time. She came in intending to help her brother and organizes it and cleans it up for him. She thought that was a deposit, see? To him it was a withdrawal. He starts really laying into her, and in the middle of his criticism, he caught himself. Oh, I shouldn't take my frustrations out on you. I'm sorry. I know you meant well. And I watched that, and I thought, that takes real presence. That takes real maturity, real respect, a lot of personal security, that he can, in the middle of his anger, take control over it. The ability to apologize, to forget and forgive, to let go of resentment, one of the most liberating and freeing things possible. But it's also an enormous deposit to another person. to look at the foundational habit, habit one, to be proactive. Why foundational? Because all of the other habits flow out of it. If habit one is present, you can cultivate the other six. If it is not present, you will not cultivate the other six. Habit one, be proactive, basically means that your life is a product of your values, not your feelings. That your life, or the organization's life, is a product of your decisions, not your conditions. The opposite of being proactive is to be reactive, which basically means that your life is a function of your feelings, your moods, your impulses, other people's treatment. The underlying principle of habit one, be proactive, is to take responsibility. The concept is you and I have the capacity to choose our response. If you don't believe that you're capable of choosing your own response. If you don't have that vision of yourself, if you're deep into victimism, I'll just about guarantee you, you will become disempowered. You will not begin with the end in mind, with careful thinking about the future. You'll be a function of the past. You will put second, third, fourth, and fifth things first, with your ladder leaning against the wrong wall. You'll think win-lose or lose-win. You'll always seek to be understood first rather than to understand. And you'll be constantly botching all kinds of relationships because both parties feel misunderstood. Ego battles will develop. At best, you'll end up with compromise instead of synergy. And you will not take the time to sharpen the saw because you simply don't have the time to get gas. You're too busy. You're buried in the thick of thin things. 
That's why habit one is so foundational, so basic. It is the vital foundational component of every other habit. Again, let's define it as the capacity, the desire to subordinate impulses, moods, feelings, conditions to values based on principles. To subordinate until little by little our emotional life, which was once like this, gets ironed out. You still may have some ups and downs emotionally, but there is a steadiness, a constancy in your nature to where you can make and keep promises to yourself and to others. Where you can treat others with kindness without capitulating your convictions. In short, to where you can begin to practice the other habits which build on top of it. How many here feel better when the weather outside is great? There's physiological reasons for that. Endorphins are released, chemical substances inside the mind through sunlight. How many do better when you feel better? That means we're reactive to the physical culture. If you were proactive, you would carry your weather within you, regardless of the physical culture. And through exuding positive energy and smiling, you also release endorphins. What about the social culture? How many feel better when you're treated better? How many do better when you feel better? That's being reactive to the social weather, the social culture. What if you could learn to carry your social weather inside so that you can be consistent in extremely difficult, adverse situations in pursuing worthy purposes and living by natural laws or principles? That's what it means to be proactive. tested every day in a thousand little ways, in the ordinary things. And if we are proactive in those things, it gradually develops extraordinary capability in handling major setbacks or disappointments. But oftentimes, we look into the more spectacular, the more dramatic, the larger issues to see the obvious energy of proactivity of habit one. For instance, Viktor Frankl, the Austrian psychiatrist, imprisoned in the death camps of Nazi Germany because he was a Jew, experienced unbelievable indignities and tortures. He was raised in the Freudian tradition that you're basically a product of your childhood. He worked on that assumption, that paradigm. But while he was in the death camps, he began to observe some very interesting things. Some people were animals, others were saints, with the same circumstances. He himself experienced terrible things. Some of his own loved ones were cremated. He expected the same fate. For some reason, they saved him for experimental purposes. One day, they stripped him naked, put him under white light, and began to perform those ignoble sterilization experiments upon his body. And he discovered what he called the last human freedom. The power to choose my response to any condition, to anything that happens to me, he called the last human freedom. And he cultivated a sense of meaning so that he saw himself in his imagination, lecturing to his students in Austria following his release from the death camp. 
about the very experiences he was having at the time, about the insights, the learnings he was acquiring. And he came to postulate that the highest value at all is the power to choose your attitude in situations over which you have no control, that that was the last human freedom. If you want to see evidence of that, how many of you have ever had a loved one, a dear friend, family member, go through a terminal illness with a magnificent attitude? How many have experienced that? Now look at the hands, look at the number. How many of you were enormously inspired by such modeling? Same hands. I just saw that with my sister, Marilyn, who just recently passed away. The night before she died, she told me, my only desire is to teach my children and my grandchildren how to die with dignity and with a desire to contribute and to live life nobly and based on principles. And the cancer inside her lung was like a tree growing up. But her whole focus during the months, even years that preceded this, was constant teaching. Those children and grandchildren and friends and loved ones will be inspired and ennobled by such modeling, such mentoring, the rest of their lives. Between what happens to us, the stimulus, whatever has happened to us, or what is now happening to us, between that stimulus and our response is a space. In that space lies our power and our freedom to choose our response. In these choices lie our growth and our happiness. In other words, with the right choices, eventually the response we choose begins to influence the stimulus. This is what Viktor Frankl discovered. And through exercising his memory, that is his self-awareness, and his imagination, and his conscience, by asking questions such as, what is this situation asking of me, instead of, what do I ask of it? Why are they doing this to me? And also by exercising his own independent will, this freedom became larger and larger until it was larger than his Nazi captors. Not his liberty. Liberty is a condition of the environment. Liberty is a condition of the externals. Freedom is a condition of the person, of the internals. We have control over our freedom, not in the short run over our liberty. However, in many situations, not necessarily all, the more you control your freedom and expand and deepen it, eventually you will influence the liberty of your life the options, the alternatives that are available to you. Eventually, your head will create your world. Your response to the stimulus will eventually influence the stimulus. Have the hypothesis, or try to look at the hypothesis. What enables these people in the death camps to survive? Is it their survival skills? No. Is it their intelligence? No. Is it their health? No. Those things were eventually equalized, lost. Helped a little initially, but eventually they were gone. Is it their family structure? No. The thing that enabled survival was a vision of the future, a sense of meaning about a work yet to do a contribution yet to make. And this became the basis
for his brilliant autobiographical account of these experiences called Man's Search for Meaning. Even a friend of his was so miserable he wanted to commit suicide, and Frankel pressed him, why don't you? He said, because if I predeceased my wife, it would make her so unhappy and miserable, and I love her so. That alone gave him meaning to survive. And he would constantly ask the question, what is life asking of you in this situation? Don't let the things you can do nothing about interfere with the things you can do a great deal about. time my brother and I were going down a canyon road with a cousin. He was chopping wood, had this axe. There was a rattler. He started chasing it. He started chopping at it. Eventually cut it in two. The front bit him right here at the crook between the forefinger and the thumb. So many ways he could have responded. He could have chased that poisonous snake and driven the poison to the heart. He was smart, quick, proactive, subordinated feelings to values, got the blood out as fast as he could. Many people get hurt by someone. It does hurt them. But the real injury is going after the person going after the snake. That's what drives the poison to the heart. It's not what people do to us that hurts us in the most fundamental sense. It's our chosen response to what they do to us that hurts us. Reactive people want to get back. They want to get even. They gather people around them that massage their heart and validate them and give them additional evidence to justify them and to condemn someone else out there who has done this injury. A lot of people gather together daily and confess the sins of their bosses. <laughs> it becomes the fabric, the content of the coffee break and the lunch. Highly reactive. Proactive people learn to get the poison out and to move on. To forgive, to forget. Resentment means to live it again and again and again and to fester, feed upon it. The net effect is to get filled with negative energy, to polarize, to seek self-justification, to look for data. That which we want to believe can easily be supported by data. The way you interpret data as Eleanor Roosevelt put it, nothing can make you feel inferior without your consent. As Gandhi put it, no one can take away your respect unless you give it to him. Proactive people who act on the basis of their values, their purposes, their vision, don't give their power away, their freedom, their power to choose to other people's weaknesses. We simply must never build our emotional life around the weaknesses of other people. Otherwise, we disempower ourselves and empower their weaknesses to continue to mess our life up. This is heavy-duty stuff, particularly for people that have had years and years of explaining away their misery in the name of somebody else. One time, a woman stood up in the middle of a group like this started to give a speech on her own, spontaneously. And then she sensed the inappropriateness of that, grew a little embarrassed and sat back down, but she could not restrain herself from talking to everyone around her. She was just filled with some kind of explosive learning or excitement. And she had positive 
energy. You could see it in her eyes and her gestures, her body language. I could hardly wait to the break to get up. Principle, that habit of being proactive means to me. I'm the full-time nurse to the most miserable, ungrateful character you can imagine. He doesn't even acknowledge me, let alone show any form of appreciation. The other full-time nurses feel just like I do. We almost sit around and talk about his demise. <laughs> Hope for it, wish for it, <laughs> while we're taking care of him. And for you to have the goal to suggest that I chose to be miserable, Come on, I didn't choose it, he made me. But then I realized how dependent I am, how I've given my power to his miserable behavior. She said, as soon as I swallowed that big, thick, bitter pill, and it hit, and I realized, wait a minute, if I chose to be miserable, I can choose otherwise. She said, I was let out of prison. I was liberated. That's when I stood up. I wanted to talk to everyone. I wanted to proclaim my freedom. I could not contain myself. I just can't tell you what that means. Between what happens to us, the stimulus, and our response to the stimulus lies our freedom. All our behavior and our actions flow from our paradigm. Deterministic psychology tends to break out into three areas, three fields. Genetic determinism, psychic determinism, environmental determinism. Genetic determinism basically means your grandparents did it to you. Yeah. I have a short fuse, it just seems to go through the generations. My father has one, and his father. Yeah, I, I'm a night person. Yeah, the whole family is. Don't talk to me in the morning, I'm not pleasant. This has come through the generations. You see, what if I had a predisposition because of my genetic makeup? Okay, that is the stimulus. Between that, and our response to it is our freedom to choose our response. So what would we do? We'd adopt a lifestyle so that it didn't activate that genetic tendency. So that our lives were not made dysfunctional from it. Now this isn't to say that we are not genetically powerfully influenced. It is to say that we are not genetically determined. And the difference between being influenced by and determined by is 180 degrees. Psychic determinism means your parents did it to you, not your grandparents. It didn't come through the DNA necessarily, the chromosomal structure of the DNA. Your parents did it to you. It's the way they raised you. It's very Freudian. Child is father to the man. That means the first few years of childhood how you were treated and raised, how you were rejected, how you developed deep psychic wounds from those abuses of one kind or another, so conditioned your emotional makeup, your personality, as to last a lifetime. The child is father to the man. And many have heard, once you're six, seven, eight, that's it. It's pretty much in concrete. There's not much you can do. Psychic determinism. No question those forces powerfully influence us. In fact, for the first several years of life, until the time of self-awareness around seven, eight, nine years old, there is no separation between stimulus and response. So that whatever stimulus went in here went right into the response. And the psychic scarring is there. The genetic tendencies are there. As soon as self-awareness begins to take place, there's a separation. This space, this freedom and power to choose. 
then those tendencies are still there. So we're powerfully influenced by genetic and psychic forces. They're there, but we still have this space. We could behave in ways that might even possibly erase these, or if not erase them, subordinate them, eclipse them, render them non-functional. They still may be there to some degree. Possibly they could be erased through different kinds of therapies. The point is you still have this freedom to choose. Even if it's that much, work on it. This whole idea of I am a product of something instead of I am the programmer that chooses my response to that product. Environmental determinism basically means that your spouse is doing it to you. Your boss is doing it to you. Your culture is doing it to you. Environmental determinism embraces the whole concept of external cultural influences. Again, without any question, we're influenced by those factors. They need to be factored in, but not determined. That's why habit one is the habit of personal vision. You can choose your response by the exercise of that freedom, that power to choose, the highest of the powers. In that space are four human endowments. Self-awareness, imagination, conscience, and independent will. Frankel could envision himself. He could see himself in a whole different situation. A company can envision its future. That's why they say the essence of leadership is vision and the ability to create a culture around that vision so that there's commitment toward that vision that is common so that everyone exercises collectively their imagination even though they have this awareness of the swamp-like culture they're in now they're aware, see, self-aware, they stand apart and can examine if we live out of our memory we're tied to the past and to that which is finite when we live out of our imagination we're tied to that which is infinite, has unbelievable potentiality, because we barely scratched what is inside of us. And then independent will. We can act on that imagination. We can act on that conscience, the universal conscience, the universal conscience of all mankind. And we can act upon it. We could swim upstream. We could go against the current. You need all four human endowments to optimize. Self-awareness is not sufficient. In my opinion, it's focused on too much. The constant exploration of one's past and the psychic and social scarring that took place. Not that it is not helpful and useful. I think it is. But it is not sufficient. It gets imbalanced if you don't use your imagination to create something new, to find a new meaning, a new value, a new future, and to independently exercise your willpower to move toward it. But imagination is insufficient. Hitler was an imaginative person, but he had no conscience. He was very value-driven, but the values were not based on principles. It's self-awareness plus imagination plus conscience plus independent will. The key is to take time to pause in that space to tap into those human endowments. Self-awareness, imagination, conscience, and independent will then begin to act small, slow ways. tell a person's proactive or reactive nature by listening to their language. 
It's kind of the fingerprint of where the locus of control is, whether it's inside or outside, really. I can't do this, have to do this. I had a student one time. Would you excuse me from class? I have to go on a tennis trip. I said, what, what? We just finished talking about how the language of the proactive person is, I choose to, I prefer to, yes, no, I will. The language of the reactive person, I have to, I must, if only, I can't, I haven't time, I'm low man on the totem pole, look what's above me, the people who need this aren't here, or if they are here, they're not getting it. I was going through all of that. He said, you excuse me from class, next week I have to go on the tennis trip. <laughs> he said, what? I have to go on the tennis trip. You, you what? I have to go. You have to go? You have to go? Oh, yeah. What will happen if you don't go? They'll kick me off the team. Seems like a natural consequence to me. If you don't go on the trips, you can't be on the team. What will happen if you don't come to my class? I don't know. <laughs> What's the natural consequence of not coming to class? I don't know, I mean, think. <laughs> what naturally will happen if you don't come to class? Well, I mean, you wouldn't kick me out, would you? Well, that, that, that would be a social consequence. That's artificial. It's not natural. If you won't participate, you shouldn't be on the team. On a tennis team, that would be natural. What will naturally happen if you don't come to class? I guess I'd miss the learning. That's right. I know if it were me, I'd choose to go on the tennis trip. <laughs> but never say you have to do anything. You have the power to choose. He meekly said, I choose to go on the tennis trip <laughs> and miss my class. <laughs> You're always working with an analysis of alternative consequences, and then you're making a choice about the actions. Remember, you can choose your actions, but you cannot choose the consequences. They're governed by natural laws or principles. You may be in some environments where they're governed by social values, social rules. Then you may have to make some tough decisions, either to become a change catalyst in some way, or to seek elsewhere, Particularly, if you've done a lot of sharpening the saw, professionally, personally, and have all kinds of options, because you are not economically dependent, you're economically independent. That doesn't mean wealthy. That means you have the power to produce sufficient wealth for your needs and the needs of your family. Why? Because your skills are not obsolete. Think on it this way. Two circles. The larger outer circle, you call the circle of concern. Things you're concerned about. Things you're worried about. But then there is an inner circle, that's very small, that are concerns you have influence over. Where do proactive people focus their energies? Which circle? The inner circle. Where do reactive people focus their energies? the outer circle. Why? Because they're victimized. Look at this person I have to live with. Look at how my boss has dead-ended my career. She says she has an open mind, but she has a closed mind. Look at these kids. They're driving me crazy. Why do you choose to go crazy? Well, I mean, what else could you do? What else could you do? Well, I don't know. Think. I don't know. Think. What other alternatives do you have other than going crazy? I don't know. <laughs> Think hard. <laughs> I guess I could maybe try to rebuild a relationship to a point that we could come up with some discipline agreements. What's your choice? 
You have the power. Always treat people as if they're proactive. The more irresponsible they are, the more you teach them about their responsibility. Always work on the inner circle. It is a marvelous thing. It is inevitable. Inevitable. If you work on the inner circle, it'll get larger. Always. Why? The energy there is positive. You're doing something at the outside edge of that inner circle that wins more confidence with other people. The way you treat them. The way you make and keep promises. The way you apologize when you make mistakes. The way you gather feedback. The way you give feedback. The way you're trying to play God in someone's life. The way you seek to understand what's important to the other so that your presentations are made in terms of their frame of reference, their language, their value system. You're constantly making deposits into the emotional bank account. But if you focus on the outer circle, you're taking withdrawals. You're judging. You're criticizing. You don't seek to understand. You're not consistent. All in the name of their inconsistency. You overreact in the name of their overreaction. You badmouth them behind their back, unaware that the people you're talking to as you do the badmouthing know you're going to do the same thing about them when there's a strain on that relationship. If you want to retain those who are present, my friends, always be loyal to those who are absent. They know you're principle centered, they know you're just not sucking up to the social value system that you're a person of integrity, that have standards. You will not participate in negative energy exchanges or do anything that in any way would create a feeling of disrespect toward another person because they know that would attach to them sometime under another situation. That's why you would never confide with one child about another or make comparisons or quick quips and judgments and labels because you create a culture that they know you're doing the same thing about them when the situation changes. No, there's a steadiness about you that is based on principles that never change. Not based upon moods that are volatile and mercurial that are always going up and down. So by working on the inner circle it gets larger and larger and larger. And eventually you begin to deal with some of those concerns that you have that today you couldn't even begin to touch. I could take you to not tens, but to hundreds, perhaps even thousands by now, of organizations that are going through a profound transformation, and it started with the person at the bottom, who worked on the circle of influence, who took responsibility, who was patient, lived the law of the harvest, who the circle of influence, gradually got larger and larger. In most cases, they came in contact with someone that had a huge circle of influence. Then, leverage, multiplication took place. Exponential leverage that started to influence entire divisions, entire companies, multi-billion, multinationals. Let me share with you one of the most powerful, instructive, illuminating experiences along this line of habit one to be proactive that I've ever had. I worked with an organization for four years and was the assistant to the president. He was a very dynamic, visionary person. So talented, so intelligent, so visionary that it could just about compensate for a multitude of sins, as far as the outside world was concerned. But his style was very controlling and dictatorial. Consequently, all the people around felt that they were treated like gophers, as if they had no judgment of their own. Go for this, do this, do this, gopher, 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 see. And they would sit around, basically, in the executive corridors, confessing the president's sins. Swapping war stories. Let me tell you the latest. I had things going. He came in to my department, gave a different signal, and totally disrupted the whole point. You, you think that's, wait, wait till you hear this one. Hey, why, why, why don't we get together at lunch? We can go further into it. 
it's, it's fun. It's fun because it becomes a kind of common cement that unites you. Construction people have the expression, bad mud, meaning if the basic content of the brick is flawed, you stress the brick, it'll break. It's the same thing happens every time you badmouth. It's bad mud. At the time, it unites you. But you take a stress on that relationship, it'll break it. Because they know you're doing the same thing. The inner circle withers. One man, name was Ben. He was proactive. His life was not a function of the president's weaknesses. He was aware of them. They were in a circle of concern, but not a circle of influence. Therefore, he smiled a lot. He didn't disempower himself. He used his strengths to compensate for the president's weaknesses in his own small circle of influence with his own people. Very strong, considerate, courageous buffer. He ran with the president's strengths, which were prodigious, enormous. So in his area, the president's strengths and his strengths compensated for the president's weaknesses. Started to cause his circle to get larger in his own area. He also exercised so much more initiative. He was treated like a gopher, go for this, go for this. But he was the best gopher around. He not only went for the data, he tried to anticipate the need. I think the president wants that for a board meeting. I'm going to give him the data, the analysis of the data, and the recommendations based on that analysis. And I'm going to put it in the presentation form. The president said to me, I can't believe Ben. It's just amazing, really. Look what he's done. I asked him to get this. He anticipated my need. He's analyzed it. He developed alternative recommendations. He came up with one, and it's in the form that I can make to the board. I think I'll have him make it. Circle of influence. Next meetings. Go for this. Go for this. Go for this. Go for this. Ben, what's your opinion? What do you think the reactive minds did in the executive corridors that day? <laughs> See, reactive people are always looking for evidence. I'll bet there's some kind of favoritism going on here. The problem is, Ben dealt with them in the same way he dealt with the president. Over a four-year period, I saw Ben become the number two person in the organization. His circle of influence got so large. Even the president would not make any significant moves without Ben's blessing. And Ben read the culture, understood the culture. So the president's weakness in style was being compensated for by Ben's strength with cultural awareness so that the president's judgments about how to implement this vision, actualize the vision, was strengthened. Amazing thing. Someone came to me one time and said, maybe you can help me. I, I really like this material, but I don't know the... The feeling in our marriage just isn't there anymore. And uh, yet we're concerned about these children. And I said, well, love her. Well, as I indicated, the feeling isn't there. The love just isn't there. Any suggestions? Love her. Well, how do you love when you don't love? Love is a verb. Love the feeling is the fruit of love the verb. Study all the great literature of all the civilizations and societies that have endured and show me anywhere where love is a feeling. That's the Hollywood culture. Love the feeling is the fruit. Look at the love that a mother feels for the new baby that she just carried and delivered into the world. She produced the love she feels. She sacrificed. 
Love is a verb. First and foremost, then it is a feeling. Forgiveness is a verb. Forgetting is a verb. I have seen so many relationships rebuilt if only one of the parties would cultivate these proactive muscles. And you have to practice these muscles, like doing push-ups. You can't all of a sudden develop strong muscles. There's a price that has to be paid, and it takes patience. Try this for 30 days. Test this concept of proactivity for 30 days. Work only on the inner circle for 30 days. Smile about the rest. On any relationship, be a light, not a judge. Be a model not a critic, for 30 days. Many couldn't make it past the first night because they're so addicted to victimism and to absolving themselves of responsibility. See, if I am not responsible, what am I? Irresponsible. So it's easier psychologically to say, I'm not responsible than to say, I'm irresponsible. But then you've denied the vision about yourself, that you have the power to choose your response. For 30 days, say to yourself, anytime I think the problem is out there, that is the problem. This 30-day test will prove to you the pragmatic power of being proactive. You're always kind of taking initiative. You go home, the place is a mess. You say nothing, you confess no one's sins. You pick it up, smilingly, cheerfully. <laughs> and then you have a good visit with the person whose job you just did. <laughs> and you don't give in, but you don't give up. You're pleasant. I want to listen to you first. What happened? You honor the person. You had the power to choose your response. Just do it for 30 days. 30 days. What is the downside, my friend? One of the initial downsides, they'll question your sincerity. You know, you're killing me with kindness and all that. Is this the new thing you learned? Did you attend a parenting seminar? I thought you said that this was a management seminar. <laughs> Think of the upside. You could become a transition figure in your own family. You know what that means? How many here see tendencies in you you're not happy with? How many see some of those tendencies going into your kids? How many have grandkids and you see some of them going to that generation? How many see some of those tendencies in your parents? Grandparents. I just went through five generations. You know what a transition figure is? It means you stop the transmission of those tendencies with you. You stop them. They don't go into your kids. If they're deep in you, you're going to have to practice more proactive muscles, imagination, conscience, independent will, more integrity, more personal sacrifice till they get out of you, so they don't go into your kids. It doesn't affect them, their spirits and their attitudes. You came out of an angry family, and you're just full of gentleness, sweetness, and kindness. Why? Because in some way you absorbed the other and radiated the new. That was part of your mission statement. You came out of families that did fighting and flighting to solve problems, You've learned to do problem solving synergistically. Do you know what it'll do? It'll back up. It'll start to affect your brothers and sisters, your parents if they're still living. That's what a transition figure is. To stop that and to create a new tradition, same thing in your business. As you know, they survive only on a local or regional basis. When you're against the global marketplace, and you've got to have deep empowerment. You can't be a little tin god anymore and throw your weight around and create a high trust culture. You have to learn to tap into the latent intelligence of all people. That's what a transition figure is.
I first came to Uganda five years ago. My original plan was to take a year off of school before I went on to law school. And uh, I saw a lot of suffering around me and a lot of uh, poverty. And so I just found myself slowly getting involved in one small thing after another and uh, decided to stay. About three years ago, John Reardon and I were working together in Kampala. And one of the things we were really struck by is the number of young men who were unemployed, uh, who were about 16 and didn't have the money to continue on in school. And they were just uh, sort of without direction. And uh, so we met a couple of them and uh, questioned them about what they would like to be involved in. And they said they would like a soccer team. So we began a soccer team with those few boys and told them to bring their friends and we would practice every day at such and such a time at a certain field and that went on for a while and soon the boys came and said they had their coach who they wanted us to meet. In Uganda you get to be sort of leery of these sort of situations and uh, so this man basically told us he, he would like to coach this team and we shouldn't worry about paying him, he, he'd just like to do it. From that time on, we became friends with Stone and uh, we began working together. Stone began playing football in high school and uh, he was recognized as a really talented soccer player. And uh, when he was about uh, 18, he was picked up by his first professional team. He played at the professional level for 10 years. By that time, he had been chosen to be on the national team, which is uh, the goal of all the Ugandan football players because you have the opportunity to uh, go and play in Europe because you're being seen by scouts from the European clubs. Soon before he began his international career, he was on a breakaway for the goal. Before he shot, a guy cut him down from behind tore the ligaments in his knee. It wasn't an accident, he did it intentionally, and that put an end to his uh, professional career. In a country where revenge is really commonplace, um, where uh, 16 years of war and corruption have been centered around revenge, Stone uh, just said to this man, don't worry about it, you did what you had to do. Stone's ability to forgive this man after pursuing a career for so long uh, was really remarkable. And we knew that the sort of integrity he had within him was exactly what these boys were going to need in order to get direction in their life. Some of these boys were druggists, some were pickpocketers, some were, let me say, wild boys. Just walk on the streets aimlessly, without direction at all. We look at these boys to give them a sense of direction. And in this, we also try to give them some skills, then some resources, then a frame of mind, you know, which can really help them in future. We just don't look at them as footballers for their future, but we want them to be good citizens. So we want them to be self-reliant, to have those skills to help them in future. The boys that Stone started with were basically rejected by their family and their community as being, uh, you know, troublemakers and problem children. But Stone really loved the boys and showed a lot of trust in them. We keep these boys just by the love just we give them. Otherwise, we don't give them money, we don't give them things. But they just come because they feel they're at home on the team. It is love that makes everything. You can never be happy unless you have love. So with that, 
we really work, work on that. That's the base of the team. It's love and forgiveness. When Stone teaches about love and forgiveness, immediately around them and learn how to forgive them. A lot of uh, the teaching of this principle is just shown by Stone's life. He lives in the same area as the boys. They know his wife, his children, the way he interacts with his family. And they see that he's actually living everything he's teaching. And so that's really the most powerful part of what he does, even more important than what he says. And I think uh, his example really challenges the boys to be like him. Leadership isn't about being famous. So even though Stone may be affecting only a couple hundred people in his community, those couple hundred people will be affecting villages, and those villages will be affecting other villages. We are trying to teach them how to lead themselves, how they can have responsibility, not that I will be there all the time, because most of these are boys and they are going to be fathers. Now what type of families will they lead? If they are left as they are, try to tell these boys that there's nothing which you cannot do. It is through hard work that all things are possible. Your life is entirely on you. What you have in your mind is what will shape your future, is what will shape you. get our sense of who we are? Where do we get our sense of what our life is about? Is it not from social mirrors, parents, siblings, teachers, leaders, the media, heroes, models, isn't that possibly the case of a mistaken identity? Think about it. Ask yourself, where do I get my knowledge of myself? And what my vision in life is? What is it that I am really about? What is truly important to me in habit two begin with the end in mind is a clear and powerful declaration that you are the guardian, the protector of your identity, of your future. In essence, habit one is the awareness that you are the programmer. It's the budding awareness that the best way to predict your future is to create it. Habit two decides what your life is about. And everything would flow from that. 
every decision, large and small, would be a function of that. Not only what your identity is, but what your purpose is. What is your vision of what your life is about? You are the programmer, then write the program. Now, another interesting thing about life is that it is always created twice. Always. Whether you take conscious control of the creation or not, you'll get your definition of yourself and of your purpose, your meaning, from the social mirror. So it was already done. Or perhaps you'll get it from the social agenda of people that are pressing upon you now. Or perhaps you'll get it from the mentoring of your childhood. Or the mentoring of your first leaders in business, your first managers, or your teachers in school. The first creation is an intellectual creation. The first creation is of the mind and of the spirit. The second creation is a physical creation. This building that we're in now was created in every detail before the earth was touched. If that was not the case, the price of the building doubled because of expensive change orders. Anyone want to share your experiences with expensive change orders? Why they came about? Okay. I'm in the restaurant business and we build a lot of restaurants. Uh, we built a restaurant a year ago that had severe access problems. We didn't plan in advance. We let external forces drive our decisions, zoning, the city, etc. And we've got a situation there where we've got a $600,000 restaurant. Nobody can come in or leave. <laughs> <laughs> now, in a sense... <clears throat> the, the food is good. <laughs> Great food, but people just can't get access to it. But really, you can get your mind so focused upon, say, the pressures that you're under, political, civic, community, and get so kind of embroiled in that battle that it starts to dominate your consciousness. And then that begins to shape your whole approach. Now we've gone in and uh, worked with people and we've taken the time and the planning necessary to make a change. And it's going to cost, you know, forty, fifty thousand dollars to make that change. But in order to make the return on the restaurant, we've Better got do to do it. I think you can see the applicability of the idea to any field of endeavor, really. I have a friend who's an orthodontist. I have paid his mortgage for the last 25 years. <laughs> because all our kids have my teeth and my wife's mouth. <laughs> Dick, how do you do this? He said, first, I get a clear image of what that mouth should look like when I finish. Every decision is governed by it. Just like the construction person comes right onto the site, the first thing goes to the blueprint. And the blueprint is all based on the artistic rendering, what the place should look like, see? How many here have ever done jigsaw puzzles? How useful is it to have the end in mind? <laughs> I find that the key is to begin with the end in mind. This is so basic with organizations. The fundamental reason, the root reason, why organizations are so split is they do not share a common vision. Do you want to have an interesting experience? Just go to your family tonight and ask them. Be sincere. They'll think you flipped out for a moment, wondering where you're coming from, but say to them, in one sentence, what is the purpose of our family? And then write down what they say. Just read the different purposes. What is the purpose of our marriage? What is its essential reason for being, and then when you go to your organization, to your work, ask the first 10 people you meet, 
Ring out your trusty clipboard and just say, I'm doing a little survey. Could you help me? One question. What is the purpose of our organization? And then you work with a small work group. What is the purpose of this work group? What is the purpose of the board of directors? What is the purpose of this executive committee? What is its essential role? What are its high priority goals? My friends, I have done this scores of times, even with the executive cabinets of companies in the Fortune 100 classification. Big companies, sophisticated organizations. And in almost all cases, the top executives are absolutely chagrined, embarrassed, they cannot believe the different descriptions that are being given as to purpose, as to vision. You think, what's going on? I mean, really. And you could have a mission statement on the wall or on little plaques on their desks or in their wallet or purse or whatever. It is not central to the culture. The whole organization cannot begin with the end in mind. What if everybody participated in the use of their proactive capacity to create that vision and to participate in it and to create it over a period of time to where they really feel it? That is our vision. We share it together. To begin with the end in mind is the most important decision. And you know, this applies to every field of human endeavor. If you don't take charge of the first creation, it will be done for you, even for you personally. And you could live your whole life based upon a very limited, straight-jacketed notion of who you are, based on a few social mirrors, and have never unleashed the talent, the unique gifts that you may have been given. Okay, now, I think we have come to recognize the power of the space and that the most significant use of it should always be, what is it I am about? And what are the principles I want to operate my life on? Would you not agree? Because every other decision will be influenced by those decisions. I want to use a metaphor. If I can borrow your glasses, please. <laughs> can you see without them? <laughs> Barely. <laughs> I suggest that whatever you decide should be put at the center of your life. The reason why it is the most significant decision is that it affects all decisions. It would be analogous to a lens through which a person would see life. Everything that I look at through this lens is affected by it. Eventually, you become unaware of the lens. Fish discover water last. Most paradigms are like that. They are assumptions you never question. That is just the way things are. So the lens I look through governs how I see everything. All right, now let's just say that I put my work at the center of my life. Everything is oriented around my work. All relationships, all pleasures, everything has to do with my work. Tell me, let's say I'm in the sales business my work is the center. How do I see my relatives? Customers. 
<laughs> contacts, customers, referral sources. How would you perceive your little children, let's say, with this pair of glasses on? Your work centered. Obstacles. Yeah, obstacles. Oh, I have to deal with that. <sighs> what an interference. Go through the motions, you know. Try to do my family thing so that I can get back to work. Now look, if I were family centered, how would I see work? As an interference, as an obstacle. Yeah, or positively, as a means, as a means to take care of the family. I'm family centered. That's another pair of glasses. But you never question your center. It's a paradigm of life. It is a pair of glasses. If your spouse centered, if your family centered, if your work centered, if your enemy centered, if your possession centered, what happens? We could go through this analysis and analyze every alternative center or even a combination of them. And literally, I'll guarantee, at the conclusion of it all, it will cause tremendous imbalance. Your life will be unfulfilled. We must come up with a center that enables us to have more of the good in every other center. What could that be? What center would enable you to lay hold on every good thing in every other center? Think for a moment. It would have to deal with whatever change came along because it would be changeless. It would have to deal with something that would give you a constant frame of reference to make all decisions by. It would have to give you the unleashing of your power, high levels of capacity, of mental and emotional and, and social power, where you become a force, the creative force of your own life where you become someone who influences for good other people's lives, who models and mentors others toward a center that they themselves select. What would this center be? It's principles. Why do you say principles? Because they don't change. Okay, they don't change. They're changeless. In fact, even as we discuss this right now, my friends, you are listening through your center. Saying principle-centered doesn't make it so. You are listening to principles through your center. The key is not just a principle. It's a balanced set of principles that deals with the totality of our nature. I suggest the essence, the highest essence of habit two, to begin with the end in mind, is the development of a personal mission statement, a personal philosophy, a personal constitution, a personal purpose statement, whatever you want to call it. I seriously think that is the most important activity of habit two. I think it should contain two basic parts. What is it I am about? And how do I go about it? What are the principles upon which I operate? It should deal in both of those parts with the essence of who am I? And you have the capacity through your mind to separate the social mirror from that question. I know what other people say about me. I know what they say I should be. But I have to decide. We lead three lives. Our public life. Here we are here. This is our public life. Our private life. When we go home, we can watch television, we can read. That's a private life. But when you're dealing with the development of a personal constitution, you have to go into the deep inner life, 
the life that influences the other two. The life where you decide the most fundamental issues of your life. Search your own hearts, for out of it flow the issues of your life. It's a more secret life. No one knows the thoughts and intents of your heart. You alone have that awareness. And you can step in on your own deep, internal life. You can step in on it. You can take charge of it. My friends, think about it. Study the lives of people that rose above difficulty, abuse, contention, dysfunctional homes. Study the lives of great figures in history who have really made a difference. And you'll almost always find they did profound work on the inner life. The private life is not the inner life. I could live a very private, independent life and enjoy it. It could be relaxing to me. It could be pleasurable. It could be my own life, my own choices. That is not the deep inner life at all. The deep inner life requires going inside and looking at your private and your public life, at both of them. It goes inside to look at your own motive structure. Many people, unless they are in pain because of something they care about that is not being fulfilled, will never even go into their deep inner life. In a sense, they're being lived. They're not living. And Gandhi, at one time he said, a person cannot do right in one department of life whilst attempting to do wrong in another department. Life is one indivisible whole. Listen to his statement. A person cannot do right in one department of life. For instance, the public life, to have the right appearance, see. Whilst attempting to do wrong in the private life, or say the deep inner life, why? Life is one indivisible whole, and people feel it. The vibes are sent out. So, my friends, I suggest work on two things, vision and principles. And this will be profound, deep work. Get perspective. Take time. Be patient. Give yourself several months, at least weeks, You've got to pay a price. Why? Because there's so much scarring. There's so much history, social and psychic history, already in you. You probably will discover pockets in your life that you don't want to look at. Closets. Motives that really are not of the highest order from your own standard. There are defense mechanisms that are used. In other words, prepare to pay the price. Autumn of 1843 was a dark time for me. I was a young author and until that year, quite successful. But my last work was not doing well. Advances on royalties were cut back drastically and I suddenly found myself faced with questions of how to meet my financial obligations. My mind was so haunted by these problems that in place of sleep I took to walking the black streets of London long after most sober people had gone to bed. On occasion, these walks brought me face to face with a time from my childhood when I worked day after day in a factory while my father was in a debtor's prison. Now I was faced with the very real possibility that those days from my past could suddenly become the future for my own family. This was horrifying to me. Get 
away from here! What are you doing around here? I don't know. We're not doing anybody any harm. Do you live in this street? Just leave us alone. Certainly, I will. I... I was sure I saw two children run from the street down this alley. They were alone. You must have seen them. These are your children. What covers them? They work in a bakery. It's how we eat. Not that you'd understand. Now please, just go away. To anyone who might have looked at my problems from their view, a solution no doubt would have seemed very simple. I was an author. I need do nothing more than quickly write, publish and sell something. In point of fact, they would have been right. There was no other solution. Not for me, at least. There were, however, difficult parts to this simple solution. They were, obviously, what to write and the speed in which that what would have to be written, the one cannot follow without the other. My mind, though, was paralysed. I was so fixed upon the depth and extent of my problems and how fast I needed to solve them, that there was no room left for that crucial what. You still not move, Mum. When I went in this morning with his breakfast, he was sitting in just the same way, only he was sleeping. Now he's awake, but he's not moved a fraction. Sir. 
Where on earth are you going at this time of night? I'm just on working, sir. I'm going home. Oh. Your father has no job of his own, then, I take it? Oh, yes, sir. He has a job. My mum, too. It's just not enough, that's all. Can I go now, sir? Yes. Uh, but tell me one thing first. Who do you work for? For people like you, sir. Then, one night, for the first time in many, many days and nights, the all-consuming thought of needing to make money left me. In place of these thoughts was put a very deep reflection, a reflection where images from the past were mingled with those from the present. Slowly, a part of myself, long buried, began to emerge from the streets I'd been walking. I felt as if I were a young boy again, working away in a factory, longing for a different life. You all right, Mum? <sighs> yes, I'm fine. I've been here for quite some time. But why, Mum? I woke up in the night and I heard him crying. And when I reached the door to go into him, he was suddenly laughing. It went on like that all night. And in between the crying and the laughing, he talks to himself. God bless him, Mum. He must be at his wit's end. No. I think he's finally writing. <laughs> <laughs> you see? Perhaps it's best if I not go in right now. <laughs> ah, Rebecca, how very glad I am to see you this morning. I'm famished. Set it here and I'll attack it immediately. <laughs> Good to see you in better spirits, sir. Very good. <laughs> That's very good indeed, even though I do say so myself. <laughs> very good. I spent many more nights in the streets, but not as a man haunted by financial doom. These nights were filled with adventure, with great bursts of imagination. They were filled with the discovery of unforgettable characters and their amazing experiences. These nights brought about in my mind the creation of the entire story. When I finally put myself to writing, I was completely consumed. I hated to leave my writing table even for a few hours of forced sleep. Day by day, the manuscript grew, not just towards completion, but towards what I felt was a renewal of my life. The story had become a reflection of what I hoped and envisioned my own life could be. In the simplest of words, it changed me. Gradually, the thoughts of money, debts and financial obligations began to recede in importance. They became much more centred on how the book could be published and sold, so that even those of very modest means could afford it. I was determined that this little story and the change it brought in my life be shared with everyone. in this ghostly little book to raise the ghost of an idea which shall not put my readers out of humour with themselves, with each other, with the season or with me. May it haunt their houses pleasantly. Their faithful friend and servant, C.D.
I find to get into nature is extremely helpful. To get alone in nature, to begin to look deeply at yourself. In fact, one of the stories I really like was this person who was filled with some kind of disease he couldn't identify. Went to see his friend who was also a physician. Can you help me? I don't know what it is. I just don't feel good. It's just a kind of a general malaise and a, I don't have much energy. Can you help me? The friend knew this person well. He talked for a period of time and then he said, yes, I think I can help you. I have four prescriptions, but you must follow them implicitly. Where is your favorite place? Well, what do you mean? When you were a boy, what did you look forward to the most? Where did you like to be? He said, oh, the beach. I mean, all year long, we would think about the beach. And every chance we had, we would go to the beach. We would have family times. I did so much. He said, fine. He writes out the prescriptions. Go to the beach and spend the day following these prescriptions. What do you do? Don't you, medicine? Follow the prescriptions. You're kidding. Wait till you see my bill. No, no, no. <laughs> but you can't take anything. No radio, no reading material, no books, no magazines. Just get deep into nature. First prescription. You take at nine. The next one at 12 the next one at three, and the next one at six. He arrives at the beach, walks down from his car, pulls out the prescription. Listen carefully. Two words. Listen carefully. What could this possibly mean? See, he's in his private life, isn't he? I mean, I've listened to everything I can hear right now. I'm finished. And I have to do this for three hours. <laughs> okay, I heard those birds, yeah. Good. I hear the surf coming in. I can even hear sand crabs if I listen very carefully. I, I can hear them. I can hear the, the wind blowing. I can hear the rustle. Isn't that interesting? The more I listen, the more I can hear. He's starting to silence himself, to get quiet, to slow down this frantic pace of his public life and his disenchanted private life. He almost, after a period of time, becomes euphoric. He's so peaceful. He just hasn't felt this way. He's getting deeper into his inner life. He's almost loath to take the second prescription because he has really enjoyed this first one. He pulls out the second one. Three words this time. Try reaching back. That throws him. What could this possibly mean? Try reaching back. Well, maybe I should start thinking about the past. So he started to get into his memory. You know, I remember after school, I, I can remember the excitement we had. I can remember my brother. What a choice association. He became very nostalgic, very emotional. He remembered running down the beach after school with his brother, just screaming like wild people. They just couldn't get enough of this fresh air, this, this scene, this freedom, and the excitement, and how they would just kind of dance around and, and hug each other, and they would have family times, and they would play in the surf and the water and build castles, and this thing went on for three more hours. And he was even more loath 
to move to the third prescription. This time, though, he was really deep into his inner life, which contains so much of memory. Third prescription. This was the tough prescription. This was the core prescription. The other two were in preparation for this one. This drove him into his deep inner life with enormous force. Re-examine your motives. For three hours, re-examine his motives. What is my center? What is my vision? What is my mission? What is my core? What is it I'm about? This was tough, really tough. He began to observe a pattern. He began to discover that he had put at the center of his life himself, his own need fulfillment, that he was selfish. Even some of his so-called selfless activities were selfish in that he wanted to be known for them. There was nothing anonymous, deeply anonymous, in his service to others. His private life was different than his public. He would put on that he was caring, but inwardly there was some selfish motive that was being served inside himself. And he started to come to an awareness, his malaise, his boredom, his disease, was of the spirit, the selfishness of his life, that his whole motive structure was improperly centered, not on true contribution. And he spent much of that time reorganizing, reorienting, replanting new motives new desires, those that were congruent with higher principles. And that was the creative part. He started using his imagination instead of just living out of his memory. You see, when you live out of your memory, you focus upon the past. When you live out of your imagination, you focus on the future. What lies behind us is nothing compared to what lies within us and ahead of us. But it took this self-analysis, this self-awareness, this self-exploration to get him to the point where he was really willing to explore, to examine his motives, and to cultivate new ones. When six o'clock came, he had finished. For the first time, he knew, I know what my life is about. I know what I'm not about to. I know the cause of my problem. I haven't yet healed it, but I know what the direction is I want to take. So he takes out the last prescription, and it says, now write your troubles in the sand. He takes a piece of shell and goes to the high water mark and makes a few markings on the sand. And the last sentence is, and the tide was coming in. It's a beautiful story. It contains a lot of real wisdom in it. It teaches you, don't start writing your mission statement yet. Prepare to write it. Now, maybe you've been preparing for a long period of time. Maybe you've done some of this deep inner work, and you're prepared for it. Everyone is at a different place. Try to tap into your sense of vision. What are your unique gifts? Use self-knowledge. Take time. Listen to those who see the potential in you. Listen to them. Sense their affirmation of you. Study the lives of people who have inspired you, of heroes. What is it you so admired? So you can get a sense of what principles you want to build upon. You want to write a mission statement that is timeless. You want to write something that will never change. Now, in fact, 
as you mature and your consciousness raises and so forth, you will change it. But you write it as if it will never change. That's the source of integrity. And integrity is the source of power. In your integrity around a balanced set of principles that you yourself have settled on. In a sense, to use the computer metaphor, habit one is the awareness you are the programmer. Habit two is where you write the program. Habit three is where you run it. You execute around it. The third habit is put first things first. I'm going to try to teach an entirely new paradigm in the field of time management. Essentially, it is a paradigm or a way of thinking which focuses on relationships rather than schedules. The traditional paradigm in the field of time management has always dealt with time, scheduling, control, efficiency, doing more things faster. The paradigm is one focused upon efficiency and control. It's called time management. So you manage your time. The clock is the symbol of it. It drives us toward efficiency. Have you ever tried to be efficient with a loved one on a tough issue? <laughs> Say with your spouse, how did it go? <laughs> Have you ever tried to be efficient with, say, a difficult teenage situation? How did it go? You see, right off the bat, you and I know how foolish it is. But look at the paradigm that drives it. So what do we do? When it doesn't work, what do we do? We try to do it better, more efficiently. We try to be nicer. We try to be more positive. But the underlying paradigm, which is not questioned, of control and efficiency, and that we're right and the other is wrong, turns people into a thing. The paradigm I'm trying to teach today is one of a compass, based upon the sense of focusing upon the first things in our lives. And they are always relationships. The older one becomes, and the wider and deeper the perspective of a person's life is, the more relationships become the supreme thing. And the essence of all effectiveness basically deals with people with relationships. But these are governed by a moral sense of principles, of what is right and what is wrong, and of integrity around those. I'm asking for sufficient openness and humility to just get into this pair of glasses, this frame of reference, this new paradigm, this new map, based upon relationships, not schedules, based upon principles, not values, based upon leadership first, then management, based upon a compass, and then the clock. Let me show you a practical way of doing this. Would everyone write down on your paper, what to you are the first things? What are the first things to you? What are the most supremely important things of your life? Things speaking in a generic sense, people, relationships, family, health, integrity. What are the first things? Just list five or six.
Now prioritize them. This is the toughest part of the thinking process, the prioritization. What would you say would be number one, then number two, then three, four, five, and so forth? If you don't prioritize them, have your spouse prioritize them for you. <laughs>I want you to answer these two questions. I want you to think of one activity that you absolutely know that if you did it superbly well and consistently would produce marvelous results in your personal life. Then do the same thing for your professional or work life. One activity that you absolutely know that if you did it superbly well and consistently would produce marvelous results. In other words, help to secure those first things you've identified. One activity under your personal, one activity under your work or professional life. now you have all written down what the first things are to you and you also have written down what is one activity in both your personal and your professional life that you know if you did it superbly well that it would have marvelous results okay now let's get into the heart of the application of this paradigm which focuses upon relationships and principles rather than things, schedules, efficiency, and control. I need a volunteer. <laughs> How would you like to consider that? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> You'd come up here, please. Your name is? Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Thank you. Good to see you. Elizabeth, you've got, how oh, you hold this? <laughs> very, very busy life, right? I do. You have a work life? I do. Family life as well? Mm -hmm. Children? Not yet. Not yet. What's the nature of your work assignment? Consulting. Consulting. Do you have a, a part of the firm, a consulting firm? Yes, I do. I direct. An international okay. firm. An international firm. Mm -hmm. So you really are interfacing with all kinds of people in the firm and outside the firm. That's right. Do you also do direct work with the clients yourself? That's right. And you have a number of associates you work with mm -hmm. all around this country and throughout the world? Mm -hmm. Starting? Yes. Kind of like us. That's right. <laughs> you want a rich personal life and a rich family life and also community and so forth. Do you ever feel like you get bogged down in the thick of thin things? Yes. <laughs> Do you ever feel like your life is kind of out of balance, out of whack? It can be. Do you ever feel like you're in the pounding surf? Mm -hmm. You know, where you just have one big wave after another knock you down, and you stagger back, and then here comes another wave, and then another one knocks you down to where it just kind of beats you up? Well, that might be analogous to all these little, small things that tend to fill our life. And that just little by little, they just accumulate. Now, your job, you can't go above this to get all those large rocks in the jar. Good luck. <laughs> I'll describe each of the rocks as she puts them in. What's that one called? Q2. Planning, preparation. Right. 
Planning, preparation, prevention, and empowerment. Q2, that which is not urgent, but important. Right. Am I picking these up in any order? Any way you want. You want to get them all in there, because they're all important. Can I move the little rocks? You, well, you have the little rocks as they are now, but you can't go above this. Okay. Can I put this down? Sure. <laughs> Okay, the next rock she's putting in there is called relationships and family. <laughs> she's trying to make it so she can get them all in there on the assumption that by moving the other ones around it makes more space. He didn't look at that third rock you put in there. That's employment, some key employment issue, and then you put major projects here. I can't get it above there. I haven't worked it yet. Oh, yeah, that's right. Is that fair? Yeah, that's fair. It's not going to work. That's called service, community, church. Do you ever feel like this? Yes. <laughs> How many feel like this? <laughs> Am I still going? Yeah, oh. you can. Try to get them in there. <laughs> You're a hands-on person. I She just put down the sharpen the saw. <laughs> How many frequently do that? I just don't have time today to sharpen the saw. You ever been too busy driving to take time to get gas? <laughs> vacation. Vacation's important to her. By moving the little things around, you might squeeze in one more of those big major things. Does that count? It's almost. <laughs> wow, that is good. You know, if it doesn't fit, force it. Well, no. You can neglect a big opportunity no. if you want. No. <laughs> Here's something that's called urgent and important. It's a quadrant one thing that is blindsiding you that uh, it's your biggest client that if you don't get back to that client now, <laughs> you've given up your vacation. No. And you have no special block of time just for yourself. No. <laughs> you have no young children. I'll tell you what you can do if you want to. You can take a whole different approach. You have a totally fresh bowl. You can work out of a different paradigm altogether. You can do anything you want. So I can use that bucket. That's what you're anything, saying. Anything, yeah. Well, then I'd rather put these in the bottom and then pour the little pebbles on top. Okay, she has sharpening the saw.
planning, preparation. Spouse. Spouse. Vacation. Employment. Big opportunity. Big opportunity. Important and urgent. Block of time. Community. Church. All those young children keep looking at me. <laughs> Glad my husband's not here. <laughs> no, I don't please him there. Okay. Got all the important things in first, right? That's right. <laughs> That's great. What did you learn? I learn if I have an opportunity to do all the things that are important first and block out when I have the fullest amount available and then all the little things will fill in the important things. Even if this were higher with the green rocks, you may neglect some of those, see? Mm -hmm. But so what? Those are just fillers fillers and they're not important. These things you've decided are the most important things. Did you also notice anything else about each of these things? Common characteristic of each of the big rocks. What have they to do with or who? With myself. Self. Some had to do with others. They all with others. affected and others. All had to do with relationships and different roles that you've got. So what if you were to shift to a paradigm of deciding, first of all, what your whole life is about so that you have a philosophical basis on which to make all of the decisions about what are the big rocks, the middle-sized, small rocks, and so forth. Put the big rocks in very first, the most important things, then the other ones accordingly. And to get out of daily planning altogether, because if you're in the daily planning, what's already happened? The little rocks are already filling up my day. Absolutely. And all you're doing now is prioritizing crises. And you have a big rock like this, like a major project, just like you tried to do. There's just no way you can fit that in. So what if you had the philosophy of relationships rather than schedules and to organize your whole life around relationships, around the roles that you have with yourself and with other people? first. Well, that's the whole idea. Thank you very much. Let's hear it for Elizabeth. Key words to understand are importance and urgency. Importance and urgency. Importance basically comes from within you. Importance is your value system, hopefully based upon principles. Importance is your mission, your central strategy to accomplish those high priority goals and plans to implement that strategy. Urgent comes from the environment. It presses upon you. It's proximate. It's right in front of you. It's often very popular. 
It could be deep into a social value system. You have to decide what is truly important. That's why I asked you. Notice the question. What are the most important things to you? And then, what are the single activities that you know without any question by doing those consistently, superbly well, would accomplish marvelous results? See, you've identified what's important. We call this a time management matrix. There are four quadrants. Now, quadrant one, you'll notice, is both urgent and important. It's like that important client that is contacting Elizabeth in her international consulting business. But it's not at a convenient time. But it's a pressing need on the part of that client. Quadrant one. She needs to attend to it. It's important. It's also urgent. Quadrant one is where you tend to move toward crisis, toward problems. If you're not in that meeting, you'll have a problem. So it's a quadrant one. You have to be in that meeting. So it's either a present problem or a problem in the making if you neglect it. Quadrant two is not urgent, but it is important. Prevention, preparation, planning, relationship building, empowerment, sharpening the saw, self-development, setting up mission statements. Quadrant two is the leadership quadrant. Quadrant three is not important, but it is urgent. Those things that are pressing, sometimes even popular, proximate, right in front of you, but not important. And four is neither urgent nor important. That would be symbolized by these small rocks, these green pebbles. All right, now, look at your paper. Look at your answers to those two questions. What quadrant were those answers in? What would you say? One activity that you know would produce marvelous results. Yes, sir, what did you have down? What quadrant? Quadrant two. Now, why isn't it one? because you're not now doing it. It's not urgent. The low urgency need. When we're driven by the urgent, when we are addicted to the urgent, it drives us into what quadrants? One and three. In fact, you examine most executive agendas against the four quadrants, and you'll find almost all of them are one and three. Two is usually called other business. What happens then to two? It gets pushed aside. Two represents the big rocks. They're pushed aside. Now what happens to one? It gets larger. How long can you sustain quadrant one lifestyle? Doesn't it soon beat you up? Doesn't it burn you out eventually? How many have felt burned out? by quadrant one, managing fires, the pounding surf, mending fences. Eventually it takes its toll on your body, on your mind. But then the dilemma is faced. Where do you get time for quadrant two? When you're inundated by quadrant one, things that are both important and urgent. You neglect quadrants three and four. You literally say no. Four isn't difficult. One of the reasons people move to four is because they are so beat up by one. So four is essentially wasted anyway. But then the key is to take it from three. Those things that are pressing, sometimes even popular, proximate, right in front of you, but not important to say no to them. Goethe taught, things which matter most must never be at the mercy of things which matter least. You can do this kind of work, this quadrant two work, when there is a burning yes inside you about the mission and the purpose and the value system. You can say no to all kinds of unimportant, however urgent other things may be. People will begin to see you differently. 
They won't just come and throw quadrant three things to you all the time, like I did one time to one of the managers who reported to me. Yeah, it's really urgent, but it was obviously quadrant three from his point of view. He said, sure, I'll work on it if you want. Pulled down his project board. I saw all the projects, deadline dates, how far he'd gone. I realized I'm dealing with someone who has purpose and organization here. I'm not going to mess up this person's life and get involved in reordering this system. So I said, well, I'll find somebody else, and I threw it to another crisis manager. <laughs> now, what if it's your boss that gives you a quadrant three project? By definition, what does that make it? One. <laughs> what is important to another person must be as important to you as the other person is to you. That's why most of you put down on your first things first list your relationships with your loved ones, your family. I know you did. I'll bet there's not an exception in this entire room. There's also not an exception in this room that the things you wrote down under the last two questions are all quadrant two. Preparation, prevention, values clarification, planning, relationship building, true recreation or empowerment. Now notice all of those have to do with relationships, either with self or preparing toward future relationships or the rebuilding of relationships. All seven habits are in quadrant two. All seven of them. Habit one, to be proactive. You have to be proactive to act on quadrant two. Why? Quadrants one and three, what? Act on you. So you just react to them. You have to be proactive to act on quadrant two. Habit two, begin with the end in mind. Why would that be quadrant two? It's not urgent to develop a mission statement or a clear sense of what this day, this week, this month, or these goals under each role is, see? Nothing's pressing me to do that. You are proacting the writing of those programs. Habit three is where Quadrant two is taught. Habits four, five, and six is the process of involving other people in a communication process in moving toward synergistically solving problems. That means come up with solutions that are better. And habit seven, sharpening the saws, the renewal habit obviously is quadrant two activity. Seriously, people that start to think in quadrant two ways will gradually change their job, their environment. Now they have to be wise and sensitive, but they're proactive. They're doing things to make things happen. They have become a force of nature. That's quadrant two thinking. I think a fireman spends his whole day rescuing people from fires. I think at one time the uh, feeling was in the fire service that buildings were going to burn and our main job was to extinguish them. And I think years ago, maybe because of money, maybe because of uh, it wasn't exciting, the emphasis wasn't on fire prevention. In the history of the fire service, it was always waiting for the big one to come in and, and having to go for that big one. And now, and most people think all we have to do is go on calls. And, it's our primary focus. It's the number one thing. If, if a call comes in, we drop everything else that we're doing. Those are our fires to put out. When the general public thinks about the fire department, they think about the fire truck screaming down the street, going to a fire with the fireman hanging on the back. However, I have a job that's not as, as glamorous as that. I'm the one that goes out and tries to prevent fires by making sure the buildings are built right, 
make sure the fire suppression systems are correctly installed. Uh, we now realize, and today's firefighters realize, that fire prevention tours, fire prevention walkthroughs, fire prevention inspections, fire education training programs, uh, teaching CPR, tours of the fire station, working with today's children who are tomorrow's leaders and could stop fires is not embarrassing and it is part of their job. We spend a lot of time in schools educating the kids ahead of time, learn not to burn, stop, drop and roll. Okay, everyone knows what this is, don't they? Oh, yeah. yeah. Come here, you want to hold it? Come on. You can touch it. Don't spray it on me, man. Don't spray it on me. Now he's putting on his fire boots and his fire pants. These are big, heavy rubber boots with metal on the bottom so no nails poke through from the bottom. These are really heavy and warm. Everything we do revolves around preparing for that 2% of the time that we actually fight the fire or handle the emergency. It's only 2% of our time. I didn't realize when I got into this um, profession how much time is actually involved in training and, and drilling and learning about new issues and um, preparing yourself for the next incident or things that you might not have seen or um, you might have learned about but you haven't yet um, encountered that. There's um, a lot of hours in, in preparation to keeping up on those skills. Uh, the fire department isn't proud of the major fires they have. Uh, what first thing we should do is critique it to see what caused it, and of course that's our obligation by law, and then what we could have done to prevent it, and what we did wrong in putting it out. Uh, we have to improve our condition. We went to the space program and borrowed their the Indy 500 and got the jaws of life or the rescue tools to cut open cars on the highways, let alone the racetrack. So we are improving our condition. It's gotten more complicated. It's not simple wood burning anymore. We go into any structure fire and we're dealing with hazardous materials. We have to be prepared for that and we have to know ahead of time what we're going into. Uh, we've looked at things not from the way we've always done them, because if you do things the way you've always done, you'll get what you've always got. One and two and three and four and five and six and seven, eight and nine and 10 and 11 and 12 and 13 and 14 and 15. What do we do now? Give two breaths. What's the next thing you do? Then we want to drop down to the ground. Okay. And then what do we want to cover up? Our face. Why do we want to cover up our face? So, so smoke doesn't get in your face. The kids are very aware of what's going on. They plan all their exits. They know they have to have two ways out and they take that home and they get their, the adults to also do that. There's an old saying in the fire service, 200 years of tradition unimpeded by change. And with our department, we like to flip it around. We've got 50 years of progress unimpeded by tradition. I think one of the most valuable uh, management tools that I have, and one that requires time, but pays off the best, is building relationships. One of the things that uh, the chief asked me to do was go out one night a week and just visit the stations and, and see that training was being accomplished and evaluate. And one of the stations I visited, when I left the station, I walked out the door and I was walking to my car and the company officer came out and followed me and he said, thanks. And he says, thanks for stopping in and just talking to us and letting us know where, where we're going. Our business cards have right on it, fire prevention is our business, your business, good business. Uh, that's unheard of. But if we don't do it, and if the fire chief says, shut the door and sit quietly, they're gonna get hurt in the long run. You know who's really gonna get hurt is the people they protect. And a community that doesn't have an active fire department is really missing something. It helps you so you know what to do when a real fire gets to your house. Feel the doors are hot or not because it can be, if it's hot, it can be a fire. Um, try and get out as fast as you can. Call 911. You should not run around. You should step, drop, and walk.
let's go through the six steps. Step number one, connect to your mission. In other words, connect to your overall philosophy, your sense of what your life is about, your vision for your life and how you see yourself, the kind of contribution, the kind of character, and the value system, hopefully centered upon principles. You connect to that first. Everything gets connected to that. You see, habit two, begin with the end in mind, is the habit of personal leadership. It basically means to get a clear sense of what your life is about. Habit three, you manage according to that leadership, according to that mission statement. That's why the first activity that you do is to connect to your mission. That's where you have the burning yes about what your life is about that gives you the courage to say no to quadrants three and four. Particularly three, because there's so much social value system driving quadrant three. And it takes an enormous amount of courage. That's why you always want to review and connect to your mission. The very next step that you go into outlines your whole life around roles, which basically means relationships. Study the roles that you have in your life. Study what you put down. You probably put down the roles having to do with your family, the key roles that you have in your work. You may be a department head. You may be a manager. You may be a technician in a particular engineering department. You may be a member of an executive committee. You may be a CEO, but you also want to think about your social roles, your community roles. Notice that's the second activity. Then you'll notice you set up your goals around each of those roles. Quadrant two. Quadrant two. When you set up your roles and goals, you're identifying quadrant two. Then you organize weekly. Why weekly? Why not daily? If you're into daily, what quadrant are you in? By definition, you're into quadrant one. Because if you organize on a daily basis, you're dealing with the urgencies. The smallest unit of planning would be a week. And then you have to adapt on a daily basis, even on an hourly basis. On what basis do you adapt? On the basis of integrity. If you have educated your conscience into principles, you will have the inward sense. You'll adapt instantly. Your scheduling is very soft. You're very hard on being principle-centered, but your scheduling is soft. And people know it, and they respect it. And they will respect your time. You exercise integrity in the moment of choice, and then you evaluate. You stand back, reflect. How's it going? Roles, goals, execute around them. I go through the six steps. Connect to the mission. Review roles. Select goals. Organize on a weekly basis. Use integrity in the moment of choice. Evaluate. Organize the whole week within the context of a longer-term plan, within the context of the mission. This is essentially the whole week. I can relax now because I know when I'm going to have my private date with my daughter, Jenny, this week. I know when I'm going to exercise. I know when I'm going to have an opportunity to go with my wife on this little Honda trail cycle that we go on almost every day of our life that I'm home because I've scheduled it. If something more important comes up, that's fine. But I try to put the big rocks in first. I put the mission statement at the top and then I just put the different roles. Then your life is balanced. See, most time management approaches teach prioritization. That's good. But what about balance? You don't want to prioritize yourself up a ladder of success leaning against the wrong wall. And you don't want to focus on schedules. It's on relationships. So all the roles involve relationships. And it's very personal. First role is the relationship to deity. It's my first and highest priority. Second, family. Third, neighbor in the large sense. I want to contribute in significant ways where there is nothing in it except that kind of service. And I'm sure many of you do. So any church work, any community service, citizenship work, 
and good causes would be under neighbor. Then chairman, chairman of a company, so I'm interested in preparing for our board of directors meeting. So I set down the goal of what kind of preparation so that we can make sure that material is sent out and time for people to prepare. Then I have writer, and then as a role as a friend. The point is, you organize around every role that you have, and you look on them as stewardships. looking at how the private victory helps to produce the public victories, that is, in our relationships with others. And this is where habits four, five, and six are involved. Habit four, as you know, is to think win-win. Habit five, to seek first to understand, then to be understood. And habit six is to synergize. So, do you want to come up and help me a minute? Look strong and healthy. You also have a very good looking head. <laughs> I, Ron, have never lost an arm wrestle. Okay. And I don't intend to now. <laughs> You're either going to be down there or I'm going to be down there. Okay? Now. See this triumvirate right there? Yes. They're going to fund this exercise. So that if he puts me down here, he gets the dime. Okay? Can the three of you have pockets that deep? <laughs> and stand over here a little more. And if I put you down here, that means you give me the dime. Fair enough? You can draw on all of those behind you. <laughs> all right, now brace yourself, Ron. Put your elbows close together. Okay. Now, you keep track. You tell us when to start, all right? What's your name? Colleen. Colleen. You tell us when to start. Give us 15 seconds, all right? Now, if he happens to put me down twice, he gets two dimes. <laughs> So keep track of how many times he puts me down or I put him down. Okay, give each other the intimidating stare. <laughs> All right. Okay, wait, start, start equal. All right, tell us when to start. faster if we both win. Yes, I see. <laughs> I mean, literally, see, everything communicates war, contest, win-lose. So, while he's thinking win-lose, you think win-win. Habit five, you always seek first the interest of the other. See, so we start with tension, then let him win, then let him win again. So gradually he starts to learn what's truly efficient. <laughs> Thank you. He learned fast, but most people, seriously, I've had some situations where they just literally hold me down. <laughs> and I say to them, 
let's let you win again. And one said to me, no way. <laughs> I mean, seriously, win-lose poisons the mind. You, you don't trust anything, see? Habit four, think win-win, lies at the very heart of all relationships. Think win-win is the habit of mutual benefit. It's the habit of the golden rule. It's the habit of abundance. The underlying paradigm or principle is abundance. There is plenty out there and to spare. So you don't have to be threatened by the strengths of other people. You can nurture competency around you higher than your own. It doesn't threaten you. You can share knowledge. You love to share knowledge. You can share recognition, gain, profit. But if people derive their sense of worth from being compared from the external, from the social value system out there, how well they stack up, they're always in a state of anxiety. They're always studying the pecking order. They're concerned about how they're dressed, how they look. They're into posturing and they are threatened by competency around them. They feel that if they share knowledge, they lose unique advantage. It gives others the same awareness they have. They lose some power. If they share power, they have less. It's like a piece of pie. There's only so much. If you get the recognition, I may not get it. If I share gain or profit with you, I, we will have less. It's the paradigm of scarcity not the paradigm of abundance. Most people have never had profound experiences with win-win people. They don't really believe there's such a thing as win-win. It's either you win or you lose. You're either tough or you're soft. You're strong or you're weak, see? They think in dichotomies, either or. Those people will inevitably produce politicized cultures where politics run things, reading tea leaves, social inventions, natural laws will not govern. Or, they will become martyrs. They'll go for lose-win, particularly among the so-called important people. And then they'll often take out their energy on the ones that they can control. So that they're lose-win above, win-lose below. What happens at the side all depends on the moods, the ego. What happens in the marriage, is it equal, is it unequal? What happens with the kids? What about your employees? Can you begin to see that the roots of the win-win mindset comes deep out of the private victory? If the private victory is real and sincere, you're at peace. You're centered. You're anchored. You're rooted. You're established. Your ego is not involved. Down deep, you're invulnerable. So you can afford to be vulnerable on the surface of your life. That's why that private victory is so foundational. Habit four, to think win-win, comes from the principle and paradigm of abundance, not scarcity, meaning the pie gets larger and larger and larger. Why? Because through the interaction, on a win-win basis, a transformation begins to take place in our natures to where we tap into more creativity, more resourcefulness, more ingenuity, more wisdom, more intelligence, deeper and deeper into the bowels of the organization, deeper in our marriage, in our family life, causing synergy to take place where the whole is truly greater than the sum of the parts, and the wealth increases, the knowledge increases, the power increases, and the very fear is unfounded. Both are self-fulfilling prophecies, however. Whatever paradigm you believe in will produce the behavior to validate the paradigm, the perception. If you have the attitude of thinking win-win, habit four, and the skill, the method of habit five, seek first to understand, then to be understood, you will create such interaction, such mutual understanding that it leads to the fruit, synergy new insights, new learnings, new heights.
It all has to start with the person. They have to begin to say, I'm going to go for win-win with people. One man said to me, Stephen, come on. I mean, the world isn't like that. I know this sounds good, but really, this is so idealistic and, and it, you know, I, I like it, but it's really not like that. I said, well, why don't you go for win-lose? He said, well, most of the time we do. Or lose-win. Sometimes we have to do that, but it is a competitive world. It isn't a cooperative world. I, I mean, I think you're living too much in the ivory tower of theory and abstraction. I said, well, I better listen to you a little more. Okay, he said, I'll tell you. He said, we try to go for win-win. We listen to your counsel and tried to practice it. In fact, just recently, we were renegotiating our lease arrangements with the mall operators and owners. And we had a win-win attitude. We were open. We were conciliatory. They saw that as weakness, <laughs> as softness. And they moved in, and they took us to the cleaners. Oh, why did you go for lose-win? We didn't. We went for win-win. I thought you said they took you to the cleaners. Yeah, they did. In other words, you lost, and they won. That's right. Well, what's that called? And it was as if it, lights went on. I did. I went for lose-win. I didn't go for win-win. Lose-win is not win-win at all. See, people who think in dichotomies believe that lose-win, being nice, being soft, is win-win. <sighs> My friends, Win-win is so much tougher, much tougher than win-lose. Why? In the early stages, you have to be tough on yourself to cultivate the empathy, the sensitivity, the openness, the consideration, at the same time, to not capitulate. What have we been calling that balance of courage and consideration? Maturity. And what is maturity a product of? Integrity. Being principle-centered, integrated around principles. Can you see why win-win is the fourth habit, not the first or the second? Can you see why it follows self-mastery? Win-win means we consent together. If you agree to disagree, is that not a win-win situation? We call it no deal. We agree to disagree agreeably. It's not going to work out. We won't hire you. You don't want to join us. You fully understand what expectations are. We understand what your needs and expectations are. And you can see that we're going in different directions. Let's agree to disagree agreeably. I would put no deal as one of the transactional options. We transacted. No deal on this one. Maybe we can come together at a later time. We transacted, see? The problem is, many situations, you don't have those options. It's hard to go for no deal with a child. <laughs> it's hard to go for no deal with an employee who's been there for, say, 15 years. That would be essentially win-lose to the employee, just to go for no deal. Now, if you could come up with a no-deal option that has the elements of win-win in it when the separation takes place so that the person feels like that was an honest and equitable and fair settlement and you feel the same way, then that is carrying no-deal in a situation where you're locked in without any other options to a successful win-win conclusion. I'm telling you, no-deal is one of the most liberating options imaginable. I'll tell you why. Look. Let's say I'm trying to interact with somebody on a very tough situation. Say this gentleman here. And I say to him right up front, if we can't work this out, you know, maybe we should work out the best no-deal arrangement possible. But I really want to go for win-win. Let me listen to you first. I need to understand how you see it. I then want to be understood. I see. Well, no deal's always an option. 
I can be very open. I don't have to manipulate. You'll have a quality of a relationship. You'll have, hopefully, a synergistic solution to problems. The spirit of consensus in the culture. The spirit of synergy and decision. That's the end in mind. It's not that I got my way or he got his way. Now, if I'm deeply committed to win, win, or no deal, I can be so open and honest, I don't have to have hidden negotiation techniques. I can just say, that's not a win as I see it, but I need to understand more. Why it's such a win? I see. Then he tries to understand me, and as we interact back and forth, something dynamic happens that is absolutely magical in its effect upon the human spirit. Gradually, we conclude, no deal is best. Or, we've come up with something that is so much better than what you and I initially thought of. Let's look at four dimensions of win-win. First, the character. I suggest these three fundamental characteristics. First, integrity. Integration around principles, around natural laws. Second, the fruit of integrity is maturity. Courage balanced with consideration. Self-confidence balanced with respect for others. Ego strength balanced with empathy. I and thou. Maturity. Third, abundance. An abundance mentality. An abundance mindset. To not interpret life as a competition. As a contest. I suggest both maturity and abundance, the abundance mentality, are the fruits of integrity. So habit four, think win-win. Not win-lose, not lose-win. And not just win. Thinking just win. You know, some people get their metaphor of life from their high school football coach at halftime. And so when their spouse takes them on, what do they do? Fight. Compete. Win. Others will go for lose-win. Step on me again. Everyone else does. <laughs> I'm a martyr. I'm no good. The dichotomy. You're either strong or you're weak. It's hard or it's soft. You win or you lose. Lose. Just the position of lose alone. I don't care whether you win or lose. I lose. This is how I see myself. Now, study the transactions. Look at every transaction as a moral one. There's a good and a bad side. You can take advantage, maybe. You can go for win-lose. You can really push your child and unkindly force your child or your employee who is so dependent upon you economically to do something that he or she doesn't want to do, maybe either for ethical reasons or competency reasons or time reasons or whatever. You can do it, but you know you've overstepped the bound. Anytime you use authority or position out of your own vain ambition, you are, in a sense, taking a withdrawal from the emotional bank account and your influence will be eroded away. Ultimately, you cannot maintain influence. The goose will die. Abundance comes from maturity, which comes from integrity. Integrity is the root. Anytime you violate something inside your conscience, a principle, see if it does not manifest itself in some way by exercising control or dominion upon another person in a sense that is too much, it's unkind, it's wrong, and you know it. Or perhaps you just capitulated and gave in and went for lose-win. The second dimension is the nature of the relationship itself. 
We call that the emotional bank account, the trust level. If you have paid the price personally and cultivated these attitudes of integrity and abundance and maturity, you'll be in a constant state of making deposits. But if you have not, you may talk win-win, but they won't necessarily feel it. And if you have a weak relationship, a win-lose relationship, that will unquestionably affect the third dimension. The third dimension has to do with the agreement that you have with that person, the commitment that you mutually make with each other. That's called a win-win transaction. The fourth dimension has to do with the systems and the processes. Are they also win-win? Did you establish a win-win approach to building the character, the relationship, and the agreements? Or are you laying on those good win-win things in win-lose ways? Do you say you value cooperation and reward competition? Strive to create the spirit where everyone can win without comparisons. How you do that is not an easy thing, but those who have done it are so much more productive than those who are always driving deep this normal distribution curve and rewarding only those at the top. In fact, I said to one, didn't you hire them all as winners? He said, yeah. And now you sort them out? The four dimensions of win-win. Can you remember what they are? First, character. Second, relationships. Third, agreements. And fourth, win-win systems. Win-win processes. You know my green and clean story. My little son agreed in a family meeting to take care of the yard. Son, your job is green and clean. It has nothing to do with watering. That's a method. Let me show you what green looks like, son. Let's go over to our neighbor's house. <laughs> That's the color we're after, son. <laughs> Compare that with our yard, which I've been taking care of. Clean means, let's clean up half of it. Now notice that compared to that. That's green and clean, son. Two weeks to train this little kid in green and clean. Now, son, how you do that is up to you. I'd tell her how I do it if you want. How would you do it, Dad? I'd turn on the sprinklers. <laughs> but you may want to use buckets or hose or spit all day long. <laughs> all we care about is what, son? Green and clean. What's green look like? Good. What's clean? Good. It's your job, son. Guess who your boss is, son? Who? You boss yourself. Guess who your helper is? Who? I am. You boss me. I do? Many times I'm away. Many times I'm very busy with other things. But if I ever have any time, you need help. You just tell me what to do and I'll do it. And guess who judges you, son? That's right. You judge yourself. How do you think you judge yourself, son? Green and clean. What's green now? What's clean now? Good. Is that a deal, son? You think about it for a day or two. Saturday. How do you feel, son? I'll do it. Do what? Green and clean. How? That's up to me. Who's your boss? I boss myself. Who judges you? I judge myself. How do you judge yourself? Green and clean. What's green? Good. Clean? Good. Who's your helper? You are if you have time. What if I don't have time? I got to do green and clean. Is that a deal, son? Deal was made. He did nothing. Two weeks of training. <laughs> Nothing all that Saturday. All that Sunday. Monday. It's Tuesday morning. Going to work. Hot. Summer day. Burning up. Yellowing. Neighbor's yard. Green and clean. Manicured. Garbage strewn right down the side lawn from a Saturday night barbecue falling out the bottom of the sack, three feet from my car. <laughs> I could rationalize a little away, 
Saturday and Sunday. But Monday, this is inexcusable. I was ready to move to win-lose. <laughs> now, son, you get out there. You get over here. Or I'm telling... But the moment you do, you kill the goose. You kill effectiveness. You go for efficiency. Yeah, he'll clean that up. And what happens tomorrow when you're not there? <sighs> Bite your tongue. Reaffirm your purpose. Raise boys, not grass. <laughs> oh, let's see what it looks like tonight. I could hardly wait to get home. Driving, going around the corner, there where my yard was. Tuesday afternoon, more cluttered, more yellow than ever. My son across the street, playing ball in the park. I was burning. We'd agree that we'd walk around the yard twice a week, and he'd show me how it's going. Hi, son. How you doing? I was faking it totally. <laughs> Just fine, Dad. How's it going in the yard, son? Just fine, Dad. That was his accountability. Why? I violated our agreement. I knew that. That's not what we agreed to do. I bit my tongue. After dinner, why don't we walk around? You can show me how it's going. Before we got to the door, you could see his lip. <laughs> <laughs> By the time we got out of the front yard, just open bawling. <laughs> Ma, it's so hard. I mean, what was hard? He hadn't done one single thing. <laughs> I'll tell you what hard is, is moving up the level of initiative. If you nag people enough, work is the course of least resistance. <laughs> you cannot hold people responsible for results if you supervise their methods. Anything you want me to do to help, son? Would you? What was our agreement? You said you'd help if you have time. I've got time. Just a minute, Dad. Ran in the house, came out with two sacks. He handed me one. He took one. It makes me vomit. <laughs> you pick that up, you know. Just took that wet garbage, stuffed it in the sack, you know. That's when he signed the win-win performance agreement. And he only asked for help a couple more times that entire summer. It was his job. It takes time to set up the agreement and to reaffirm it. Tendency is to backslide on it when you see mistakes. Keep believing in the people. Holding them accountable in the way agreed. Mark, will you come to the front of the class? As all of you know, the extended learning program is an honor. And while many of you are eligible, only students with the highest scores can be chosen to participate. I'm recommending Michelle and Mark for the program. Michelle had an outstanding score, and Mark followed with a pretty close second. Congratulations. Let's stand and give them a big round of applause. Yay! <laughs> Take these home. I need signatures from your parents before you can start. I'm proud of you both. All right. 
When doing your homework, why should you study your most difficult subjects first and easier subjects last? Mark? There's just no way she got a higher test score than me. There's got to be a mistake, and I want to see the scores. Besides, she cheated. I did not. <laughs> Anyone else for my question about study habits? Michelle. Not everyone finds every subject easy. It's best to study the most difficult subject first when your mind is fresh. That's right. Michelle is a good example for proper study habits. Okay, take out your history books and turn to page 27. Who discovered America? John. Christopher Columbus. That's right. In 1400... And 92. Wait a minute! First of all, Columbus didn't discover America. The Vikings did. Columbus was such an idiot. When he first came to America, Mark. he thought it was the Far East. Mark. Duh. Mark, that's enough. He murdered and tricked lots of natives just so he could Stop get what he it. wanted. Mark, step into the hall and wait there until I come out. But it's true. Call my dad if you don't believe me. Out. Fine, I'm going. I'll relish the moments alone. At least I didn't cheat on my EOP test. <laughs> so there I was, sitting in this camp at the stoplight, and all of a sudden I hear this bang, but up, but up. And this person rolled over the top of the car and lands on the hood. He gets up, brushes himself off, hands the broken antenna to the cab, <laughs> gets back on his bike and rides away. <laughs> Don't tell me Cabby didn't even flinch. Didn't even flinch. <laughs> Margie, pass the pepper. Margie, are you all right? Just fine. You've been kind of grouchy since you got home. What, what's going on? Margie, what's going on? Nothing's going on, all right? And stop calling me Margie. I hate that. Hey, wait a minute. Oh, why do you care? You go. When's the last time the two of you had a good heart to heart? Okay. Mark, take him in. Just go away! Something happened at school? I won't go back to that school, and you can't make me. I don't want to make you do anything. But I want to help you. Now, what's the problem? Let's work this out. Mrs. Tatum is the problem. She's stupid, and she doesn't like me. First, she ignores me, and then she yells at me in front of the whole class about Christopher Columbus, and I'm not going back. She was wrong to yell at you in front of the class. But you've been so sensitive lately, maybe you misunderstood her. Right. I knew you'd take her side. She made me go out into the hall again. I'm not going back tomorrow. Look, son, running away from the problem isn't doing you any good. When I was your age, my father told me, never walk away from a fight. Yeah, well, I'm not you. Come on, I'm with you on this here, huh? Hey, you made the ELP. That was great. Yeah, but my test score was a pretty close second. Hey, will you do better next time? Come on, last one down's a rotten egg. All right, clear off your desks. We're going to have the oral quiz I told you about yesterday. Yes, Mark? And, uh, what oral quiz might this be? The quiz I talked about when you were out in the hall? Don't worry, Mark, this doesn't affect your final grade. You're welcome to sit and listen or go to the library. Fine. I'll go to the library. This audit really shouldn't worry you. I mean, it doesn't worry me as long as... Mark, you didn't clean the logs. No. Well, you never showed me the mileage logs. Yes, I did. 
Look, can you just bring it over here tomorrow and we'll go... Uh, yeah. Can you hold on a second? I'll be right with you. It's Mark. She did it again, Dad. You sent me to the library while the rest of the class is taking a test. Mark, aren't you overreacting just a little? See? You never believe me. They're in there right now taking a test, and she's leaving me out. If you don't come pick me up, I'll start walking home. No, stay put. Don't worry, I'll be there in a few minutes. I'll take care of this myself. <sighs> Hi, yeah, I'm sorry. Can you just bring all that over here tomorrow, and we'll go over it here? All right. I appreciate it. Thanks very much. Hello, Mr. Taylor. Seems we have a little problem here. Yesterday, Mark came home and he's pretty upset. Upset about what? What happened? Oh, sure. Oh. Now she cares. Well, of course I care. What's this about, Mark? Something about Columbus. And uh, about a half hour ago, I got a call from him saying he wasn't being included on some test. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Mr. Taylor, at times your son is too smart for his own good. I had to send Mark out of the classroom because it was being disruptive. That wasn't the first time. First time for what? Being sent out of the classroom or for being disruptive? Being disruptive. He spends a fair amount of his time correcting me and his classmates instead of concentrating on what he needs to get done for himself. That's not fair. I do not. Mark, can you wait out in the hall? Give me a couple minutes. Yeah. Okay. Are you okay, honey? I got your message. What happened? Okay. I can't allow my students to constantly challenge my authority as a teacher. Mark can't continually correct me in front of the others or I lose their respect. I'm sure you can understand that. I'm trying to understand. Uh, let me start by saying we've taught Mark to question authority. Correct me if I'm wrong, but hasn't there at least been a time or two when Mark has shared with the class and was right? Really, right or wrong has nothing to do with it. Yes, but how you're handling Marky has everything to do with it. I'm sensing that he's a threat. <laughs> but we're talking about two different things here, and Can I we just cut to the would... chase, Mrs. Tatum? Again, I'm just trying to understand. What I'm hearing is that you want to be respected as a teacher. But it really appears as though you're not willing to show respect yourself. Please, let me finish what I was going to say. And keeping credibility as a teacher at this point is at our son's expense. Now, how long has this been going on? Mark has been frustrated with school for quite a while. Why wasn't this brought to our attention earlier? I had no idea Mark was frustrated. I mean, really? How could you not know? And isn't that in and of itself part of the problem? Wait a minute. This is being blown way out of proportion. I didn't think it was a big enough issue to involve both of you. Oh, so there is an issue. Now, Mrs. Tatum, it might not have been a big enough issue for you, but you need to look at what Mark's been going through. Don't minimize his frustration. As, as parents, we have to trust his intuition. Here. So who trusts mine? As a teacher, I can't have students showing lack of respect and disrupting the classroom. Is that too much to ask? Besides, where do you get off telling me how to do my job? It's difficult when Mark's attitude is... Well, he comes off as a know-it-all. A know-it-all? Mrs. Tatum, listen to yourself. What teacher wouldn't appreciate bright children in her classroom? Now, maybe the problem isn't with our son, but with your ability to handle intelligent children. I think you owe Mark an apology. Oh, both of you stop. Just stop. Now that's it. You've missed the point of what I've been trying to say since the beginning. You could care less about my opinion or my feelings for that matter. You know what? I think you owe Mark an apology. That's right, for always expecting him to be at the top of his class. I've read your comments back to me on his report card. Push, push, because anything short of first place isn't good enough, is it? Well, it's good enough for me, and it's good enough for Mark. <sighs> He's a good kid. Don't ruin his chances of becoming a human being. You want to talk? I'll be in the principal's office. Fine. Let's all sit down with the principal. And we'll relish these moments together as human beings. Wait. What 
What's happening? It's obvious. She can't handle the truth. Mark, stop. This is our son's welfare we're dealing with here, not some battle of the egos. Egos? What are you insinuating? I'm not about to back down now. Gee, from the way it was sounding, you must have laid it on pretty thick before I came in here. Why else would she have stormed off like that? Look who's talking. Everything was fine until you said that bit about her not being able to handle bright children. That's what set her off, plus that apology thing. Stop it! Both of you just stop it! People can hear you guys fighting. Let's just go home. Look, Mark's teacher and the principal are waiting down the hall. We can't be at odds with each other right now. Let's just not get into this with them. Right. We better go talk to them. Okay. Marky, everything's gonna be okay. Don't you worry about a thing. This time, huh? No, wait. I'll go through the old ones first. Let's see. There's uh, the car won't start. Heard that one a lot. Then there's uh, the subway was late. The bus was late. Your sick sister called. The apartment burned down. Your dog has a limp. Are you really interested in the reason, Otto? No. It's good to get out of the office, don't you think? I'm not paid to think, sir. Excuse me. Well, I just said, yes, this is great. I don't think I could have faced the company cafeteria today. Cafeteria? The cafeteria is no place to have a person-to-person -person chat. I wanted to get out of there, have a real informal give and take. Years ago, when I had a phone booth size office... Informal? That means friendly, right? I can't really be friendly. I mean, look at this guy. But hey, come on, think. Think friendly. Talk friendly. So why don't you start by telling me how you feel about your first quarter on the job? How are you doing? How am I doing? How do you feel? Well, wait, wait. Before you tell me how you feel, let me tell you how we think you ought to feel. Now look, sweetie, life's full of things we don't like, but let's start this over again. How's the job going? Horrible. And the people at work, are they listening to you more now? No. Nope. Well, name a few things maybe that you like about your job. There aren't any. <laughs> sweetie, those are the same answers you gave us two minutes ago. You folks need a little more time? I'm afraid so. No, we're fine. I'll have the house salad, and she will have chicken fingers. But, Mom... I don't want chicken fingers. Coming sure to some do. of the things more specific to the account you're both working on, I'm sensing a gradual falling off of client confidence, and I was hoping... Hey, could I just jump in here a second and say I think you're absolutely right? Me too. You think so? Mm-hmm. Well, I thought I was alone in my thinking. I'm right with you. Oh, me too. Well, if it's agreeable to both of you, let me start with some of the thinking I've been doing. Oh, please, do. Oh, we always welcome that. That's my table. Now, when you're late, it isn't. Otto, this order isn't right. What's wrong? The lady who ordered this wanted it low-fat. This has butter all over it. You didn't say you wanted low-fat. I did, too. No, you didn't. Otto, I did, too. It says so right here on the order, low-fat. I didn't read that. Excuse me? Look, Meg, I expect the people at work for me to talk to me. Now, if you just waltz right in here, show me an order, expect me to read it, everybody else who works for me talks to me. Maybe you could learn something from that. Ordering two specials, one with and one without, and try and get it right this time. What are you looking at? I'm learning from you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There, see? He brings me an order and he talks to me. And then you send him out with the wrong order. At least we're communicating. I'll tell you, though, that wise old owl of a boss made all the difference in the world how I felt about my How job. he felt. Feelings. He said it again? All right, courage now. Here we go. That's how I feel, too, sir. I can't tell you what a great feeling it is to occupy one of those phone booth offices. Hey, you want to be careful about feelings on the job, son. Oh, well, I... Well, you just said that, that feelings were, uh, what I meant was that feeling was very important. I know where you're coming from, son, but, uh, just watch the feelings. Why is that, sir? They're not cost-effective. Yes, sir. That's why the performance review is such a great tool for people like me whose task it is to guide people like you. Huh. Okay, now, let me try and come at this from a different way. Talking about your job, you mean? Right, right. Now, last week I saw a movie, and it got me thinking about my job. I know that sounds stupid. That's not stupid at all, sweetie. Kind of depends on what the movie, doesn't it? But your mom is right. As a matter of fact, it was just after we saw Casablanca that we decided to get married. Isn't that right? That's right. But the whole thing is you're talking to us now. So, sorry. Go ahead. I forgot where I was. You were talking about Casablanca. And your job. Well, I'm rambling a bit, so... <laughs> Let me come back to the point of time. The amount of time... Time! Absolutely. 
You know, I don't think the client realizes just how much time we put into their account. Well, actually, I can only speak for myself and the amount of time that I put in. I know that he gets tied up with a lot of other things and can't always dig right in there with me. I'm in total agreement with what she's saying. The client doesn't have a clue. They don't see how I have to pick up some of the loose ends that she understandably overlooks but still have to be done. Done. But we're not telling you anything new. You know exactly what we're talking about. I think I'm starting to. <laughs> Smooth, May. Did your brain wake up with the rest of you this morning? At least I have a brain. At least I have a brain. I'm sure you're getting a sense for how efficient these performance reviews are. How they're designed to let the employer... They're efficient, all right. Like all the overtime being put in by phone booth man here that was efficiently overlooked. But okay, stay calm. If his mouth ever stops flapping, dive right into the teamwork thing and then just work from there. So let's flip over here now from teamwork to initiative. Excuse me, sir. Uh, could we stay on teamwork for another minute? Well, it breaks up the flow of the review, but maybe just half a minute then. There was one particular project that I wanted to mention. Um, it was about a month ago and we were working ah, on... Ah, the anxieties of youth. The roads they have not traveled. The blocks they have not been around. The executive washrooms they have not entered. The claws I must wield to dry behind their wet ears. Look, sweetie, use the plainest language you can to describe your situation. The plainest language I can use is that I hate my job. Hate's a pretty strong word, sweetie. Maybe there's a better one. Disillusion, maybe. It's pretty easy for somebody who's new in a job like you are not to see the big picture yet. Not to see all the facts. Facts. Oh, now that's a great word. Just the facts. What are the facts? That's all my job wants out of me. Facts mean money, sweetie. You can say that again. And you know why? Because the facts are what's left when all the truth has been sucked out. Why aren't you eating, sweetie? Because I don't like them. Sure you do. We interact very loosely with these accounts I know, and sometimes the lines of responsibility... Responsibility, exactly. Good word. Uh, see, I'd like to point out, and I'm sure my colleague here would agree, it all boils down to responsibility. Or the lack of it. And it doesn't matter what the facts are. I mean, you know I'm doing this, and she's not doing that. But what am I always doing that he's usually missing? The real question should always be, is the project getting done? Don't you think? Absolutely. Where have you two been? I got food sitting here. Maybe they'll just have to stay sitting there. Oh, what's that supposed to mean? Hey, Otto, you can't expect the princess to wait on tables with wine sauce on her dress, huh? Why are you always such a buzzer to me? Oh, no. So, teamwork, while it's uh, a wonderful thing, and uh, you did mention that... He's got to be winding down, so chew your bottom lip off before you break the flow and watch him glaze over again. Teamwork's a bust now, so lead off with problem solving, zip right into meeting deadlines and the three projects you had in ahead of schedule, and then just keep blasting away. Turn that precious performance review of his into a range target. These are some bitter pills to swallow, I know. Well, but that's that's life, isn't it? You know, I was taught pretty young that... Oh, I'm sure you were. Well, it's that time in the review process with the blanks all filled in, the possible questions all answered, the evaluations total, complete and irrefutable for you to offer any limited input you may have. So I'll, I'll just shut up now and, and listen to you for a minute or two. Uh, well, uh... Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, oh, well, I was thinking that I'd, I'd like to start out with... Yes, yes, my young friend. Go through your list. I know it by heart. Uh, if I didn't love mentoring so much, if I weren't so good at it. If there wasn't so much more good advice to come when your little rebuttal is finished, the process would be all too painful. Where's that dessert tray? <clears throat> and Dad. Now, honey, I think a good deal of what's troubling you right now is that you feel you're alone with these feelings. That nobody else has ever gone through what you've gone through right now. That's not it at all. Oh, sure it is. And I say, miss, our daughter here has just gone on from college to a good job. A really good job, as a matter of fact. And she's practically raised this gal all by herself. I mean, we helped a little. But anyway, now she's got a lot of things swimming around in her head about this new life change. And this new job. Right. She saw Casablanca the other night, and that really got her thinking. What we're trying to tell her is that we understand that even though we spent a lot of money to send her to a great school and helped her with our young granddaughter here, that we can still sympathize with her situation because we're her parents. Am I right? Absolutely. My parents tell me to quit my job all the time. Ha! Mom, I don't like these. It's okay, sweetie. Life's full of things we don't like. Folks okay here for now? Oh, yeah. Is it 100% all boils good down enough? And the See, I've decided in my own mind it isn't. The world's I've day demands many, many more, and I know because I've been giving it. I mean, let's face it, when you work with another person, partner. you have to expect you're I've going to do your job and their job. And in this case, that adds up to at least 150%. Well, truly, this is more than I hope would even come from this lunch. You're off the account. I feel 
You're off the account. Action to take now, and I didn't have any idea what to do until we met. You're both off the account. What do you mean? It just hits you that you want to quit. You say you're gonna quit every day. Last week your mother called and said you were gonna quit. Well, today we need it. What, you gotta do it right now, right in the middle of lunch hour. That's how I'm feeling right now. Can I tell you some of the feelings that I have? I have feelings too, man. Just one minute. Just... All right, one minute. Start talking. There's reasons I act the way I do. Well, I'm thinking. I'm leaving. I, okay, okay, all right. Okay, I deserve that. Look, May, you see, I've been sick. Oh, please, every day for six months? I, six months? That's how long I've been working here, Otto. Really? Bye, Otto. <laughs> Look, May, I'm sorry, okay? Is that what you want to hear? I'm an idiot, I'm, I'm a jerk, I'm a dumbbell. I love you, May, and I know you love me, too. You can't expect that line to work every time, you know, Otto. study every field of human endeavor, you study every problem-solving process in every profession without an exception, and you'll always find to understand precedes action. To understand precedes judgment. Lawyers go through a discovery process, often even prepare the case for the opposing counsel. Doctors diagnose before they prescribe. Teachers pre-assess before they teach. What does the amateur salesperson do? Sells products. What does the professional salesperson do? Sells solutions. It's habit five. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. The tendency in almost all people initially is to want to be understood, or if they do seek to understand, they seek with the intent to reply, with the intent to in some way influence, to some way bring the person about, to accomplish their own end, not with the intent to understand. Now, what's your first name? Hal. Hal? Why does Hal wear those glasses? Okay, but what did the optometrist do before he prescribed? He diagnosed. The optometrist tried to understand. The optometrist was first influenced before attempting to influence, and that helped in the diagnosis and the prescription. And that is why Hal wears these glasses. Can I borrow your glasses for a second? You'll love these. <laughs> these will really change your paradigm. These are, <laughs> these are more powerful? <laughs> <laughs> My friend, you've liked these, haven't you? For a long time. For a long time. We're sure they'll help you. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. My friend. What's your first name? Anna. Anna? Try harder. <laughs> I mean, really give those lenses the college try. That help you now? No. <laughs> no. 
think positively. I mean, there's nothing wrong, Anna, with this program that a good positive attitude can't correct. Getting dizzy. <laughs> Getting dizzy? This is the company way, Anna. <laughs> How current your resume? <laughs> you like them now? No. <laughs> they look good on you, Anna. <laughs> Wouldn't you agree? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> See, we all feel they look good on you. <laughs> Anna. Daughter, your mother and I, for many years, have distilled the wisdom of our life for your benefit. That's intergenerational wisdom, too, Anna. <laughs> We've learned it from before. And we put them in the form of those lenses. We've done our best. Anna, you like them now? They're great, but I still can't see. <laughs> <laughs> They're great, but I can't see. That's kind of a double message, Anna. I mean, do you have any idea the kinds of sacrifices that your mother and I have made for you? <laughs> The things we have done for your benefit? Huh? In fact, you know what your mother even did to bring you into the world? <laughs> <laughs> and the efforts we're making to give to you every opportunity? I mean, what more do we have to say to you? Anna? Like them now? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> She's got some integrity. <laughs> Usually people capitulate, but usually I don't give them that strong of a lens. <laughs> when they capitulate, I then move to the next person. How do you like them? I like them. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. For the, all those who are quick studies, they are rewarded. You can wear them the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> are those tears of gratitude? <laughs> there you are, my friend. You can oh, see again. <laughs> I could feel your anxiety <laughs> level. <laughs> now, when I'm convinced I'm right, when you're convinced you're right, do we really want other people's opinions? How many of us, when we are in that mental state, use those methods? You may not use the more extreme ones. You may just simply use the more common ones. Try harder. Just think positively. It'll make the difference. Well, what's so scary is if you don't use those methods and you let somebody talk, seek first to understand, you might have your mind changed. And a lot of us don't want our mind changed. We want to stay on that same path that we feel comfortable with. It's very interesting what he just said. If we really start listening, you may be influenced, particularly if our security lies in being right. If you really seek to understand, you run the risk. You're vulnerable. Can you begin to get a better understanding as to why we have the private victory of one, two, and three? Why? So you can have the self-confidence. Okay, the confidence, your security, security comes from integrity to principles, not from being right. So you could be the first person to say, I was wrong. You learn real fast. But almost everyone is anxious to prescribe glasses for eyes they have not diagnosed because if they really engage in a meaningful dialogue with me, they become vulnerable themselves. It exposes sometimes their own center, their own need to be right, their own need to give wise counsel, to shape up this son, this daughter, this employee, even this customer. <laughs> you don't know what you need. We know what you need. We'll tell you.
let me describe five levels of listening itself. You might say it's a continuum of listening. The lowest level is to not listen at all. We could almost use the word you ignore somebody. You're not even there hardly at all. You're just into your own world or whatever. The second level is you pretend to listen. You may learn the body language and give the, you know, even the mimicking responses of the last person's sentence. The third level is to listen selectively. You are really hearing. Oh yeah, that, that, that reminds me. <laughs> let, let me share. Oh, I agree with that, yeah. Oh yeah. Well, what you said back there, I know exactly what you mean. I've had the same kind of experience. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. I mean, see, you did understand. But your mind is so into your own hot buttons that you're listening always in terms of those buttons and those interests. But you did understand. The fourth level is to listen attentively. You're really giving full attention out of real sincerity. That takes a lot of energy, really, to attend to another. But still, you're into your head. The fifth is to listen empathically, to leave your head, to get into their head and their heart. Not that you are trying to sympathize or agree or disagree. You take no position at all. Remember how we have used the iceberg as a kind of uh, metaphor? Well, it really pertains to the subject of empathy and communication. We talked about the tip being just the technique. You know what the great mass of the iceberg is? The motive. The deeper attitude. Are you really anxious to understand? Now, the magic really comes from the human affirmation process. If we were to suck the air out of this room right now, what would happen to our interest? <laughs> now that we have air, does air motivate us? What is it that motivates us? The absence of air. The psychological equivalent of air is to feel understood. It is the deepest hunger of the human heart. But to give someone psychological air, it makes it almost impossible for someone to fight you. It so feeds a person's spirit. It so nourishes and nurtures that they become open, non-defensive. One time, a father said, I don't understand, my boy. He won't listen to me at all. I said, you don't understand your boy because he won't listen to you. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Let me restate again what I heard exactly you saying. You don't understand your boy because he won't listen to you. And that's really frustrating. Yeah, I mean, you don't understand you. Why do you keep repeating it? I thought to understand another, you needed to listen to them. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I, I understand my boy. I understand him. I mean, I've been there. I know exactly what he's talking about. He hasn't the foggiest. No one's ever been there. Everyone's life is so singular, so unique. Who's going to listen to that uniqueness? Let's have a role play, okay? I'll try to set the situation up. I am your son, you are my father, or my mother, and I'm interacting with you, and uh, I'm rather upset, and now I'll use the alter ego technique, but you have to act 
as if you cannot hear that. You hear it only as a participant in this process, not in the role. It'll give insight to all of us in our learning role. Okay? <laughs> I just had it with school, Dad. I just get nothing out of it at all. Tell me more. Well, it just seems to have no value. I mean, it isn't practical. It, it doesn't deal with life. It doesn't deal with, with real things. It's just so kind of theoretical, Dad. So, so what are you telling me? I, I don't understand, Stephen. Well, I'm just trying to tell you that I don't know, I'm just, I don't know if I should even stay in school. I mean, I, I, I don't know, I just, I don't see much value in it at all. And so, so, so you're telling me you're thinking about dropping out? Why not? I mean, my friend Joe did. He did, and he's got a great job, and he is learning a lot more than I am. I'm telling you that right now. He really is, a lot more. Well, I'm not sure that's what you really want to do, is it? Let's, let's talk about it for a second. Boy, I'd like to talk about what I want to talk about. But I don't want to talk about school. Are you listening to me? <laughs> <laughs> see, you didn't see any of that. <laughs> yeah, Mom, I mean, I just... Uh, it's just, uh, I don't know, it's just so frustrating sometimes. I learn so, so little and everything. Well, if you just apply yourself more. <laughs> I mean, I have. I, I, I've tried to apply myself, and I've really given it. I've been there now for two months. I mean, that is a real good effort. Well, I just don't think you're giving it all your effort. I mean, look at your sister. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. <laughs> yeah, I know, but uh, she just she, she just takes this to this stuff. I mean, she just loves it, and she doesn't have the same interest that I have, Mom. And I just I, I just don't know why there should be any basis there at all. Well, your dad and I work really hard for you to be in this special school. I mean, I've even taken on a job now so that we can put you in the school. Oh, I know you meant to do all that, and it's not that I'm not grateful for what you and dad are trying to do. It's just that it's just so difficult, and I mean, it's, I, I don't see much use in it. I mean, it just, you know, they, they deal with so much abstraction and, uh, you know, all this theory. Well, I, I think you just need to apply yourself better. Maybe if we get you a tutor. Oh, boy, now I've got to deal with that. <laughs> well, you can't just quit. You'll never get into the college of oh, your Oh, I choice. wish I could talk about what I want to talk about. <laughs> but I guess she wants to persist in this, and I'm feeling kind of so bad after all that they've been trying to do and everything. Well, I guess I just don't understand. Maybe you can help me understand what it is that, that you really want. I just, I don't understand. Well, I sure don't feel understood, but I don't want to get into what I really want to understand right now. <laughs> Not after my sister and with all of the things that <laughs> her, she and my father have been doing for me on all my life. I just, well, I'm just trying to say that I just don't know if there's much worth and value to this, Dad. I, I just, uh, I, I've given it a good shot, and you know what I mean? If, uh, if, it, if it isn't school that you want to do, then what do you want to do? Boy, I wish I could talk about what I want to talk about, but Dad wants me to get into action planning about how we're doing. Well, I, I, I have to confront you know, all this theory that's being presented every day. And, I mean, take the social studies. They never even deal with what stuff's in the newspaper that I even hear you talk about, Dad. Just gets me into all of this abstract stuff. In other words, you're saying learning's a tough experience? Well, it's not that. It's just, it's just, I don't know. It's just... You know, son, I'd like to relate something to you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
can check with your grandfather on this. And he'll help. <laughs> when I was 16 years old, and we had come back from Mexico, and my, and uh, oh, I wish I could talk about what I want to talk uh, about. You know, but I was pretty. Well I don't know. Outside. I have to listen to Dad's autobiography <laughs> again. <laughs> I've heard chapters three and four so many times in my life, and. At 16 years old. And I even heard about the background chapter that was put in the appendix of his autobiography about his grandfather. And I don't know, but I'll have to be pleasant and because I can see. Why don't we do this, son? If you really feel there's no point in me trying to browbeat you to stay in school. If you really feel that this is what you want to do, why don't we take one semester or six months or whatever here and let's have a trial basis here, and you go out and work. Oh, I'm just oh, so heartsick now because he's 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 come to the OK Corral for the gunfight, and <laughs> oh, I, I wish I wish I could talk really about what I'm feeling inside, and but now my I, I'm getting so I'm so torn, but I'm partly mad about this thing, and. Well, maybe we should. That might be a good idea. I think yeah, you that could might move, be a good you idea. You could probably move in with Joe, and the two of you could really see. I don't know if Mom would go along with that. Oh, I th she I loves th me, and I she's th told me that. <laughs> good trip. Don't you think I love you, son? Come over here, and I'll give you a kiss. <laughs> oh, I don't know what to say. I just. Oh, I wish I could talk about, really, what's happening to me inside. I guess I've just kind of had it, Mom. Maybe you've had it at home. Maybe I should do exactly what you're saying. What is it that you want? Just notice what happens when you ask questions, when you probe. Notice what happens when you give advice. Remember the stimulus response concept? See, most of us have been trained all of our life. In order to get understanding, ask questions. But when you ask questions, where do your questions come from? Whose autobiography? Your own. Your own frame of reference. Your own value system. And you could be so well-meaning, but you're still controlling and directing. So be hesitant about questions. In fact, be hesitant about anything that is autobiographical. Now look, you know what autobiography means? Autobiography, what does that mean? Yeah, out of yourself. Now, the best of intentions, and I can feel your warmth, I can feel your caring without any question. It comes right through your face and your eyes. But. If you probe, if you advise, if you evaluate, which means to either agree or disagree, or if you interpret, that means to figure me out, or to have some hidden scenario or theory in your own mind that you're kind of working on. If I could bring Stephen around to this, see, maybe, maybe the thing that's really bothering him is this, see. All four are autobiographical. With the best of intentions, but still autobiographical. It's one of the main reasons, really, why many parents do not get close to their kids. With the best of intentions, they're doing these autobiographical things. They mean so well. It is so real to them. How's it going, son? Fine. Well, uh, what's happening lately, son? Not much. <laughs> well, uh, how'd they go in school today? Fine. Well, uh, son, uh, what did you do uh, after school? I, uh, we kind of played around, played basketball. Or who'd you play with? Tom. Just kind of threw around a little. Did you enjoy it? Yeah? What's wrong with you, kid? I'm trying the best I can to help you, to show my care for you, to do something with you. You give me these short, clipped answers, 
and you talk endlessly with other people. Don't you know what your mother and I have done? Do you have any idea the things we have done, the price we have paid? Now go ahead, son. Open up. Tell us how you feel. Now, if you have an extremely large emotional bank account with somebody, you know, people can take off with each other, they can use autobiographical, and they can direct and advise. I'm not saying that those autobiographical approaches are not appropriate at all. If someone were to say to me, Stephen, where's the restroom? I wouldn't say, you're really hurting. <laughs> all I'm saying is, if you're really trying to empathically listen within the other's frame of reference, then autobiographical responses are not useful. Now let me try to put in perspective this continuum of empathy. Empathy is one of many forms of communication, and all forms of communication have their place and their validity. I mean, probably one of the best things to do is to learn how to ask questions of other people, to find out all kinds of information. If you find the information isn't really safe and is really filled with a lot of emotion, and if they also desire to be understood and you have enough credibility in their mind that you would be a person that they might open up with a little, then start empathy rather than autobiography. But if the emotional bank account is there, if the issue is not that jugular, not that emotional, and if they're totally willing to be understood, like a doctor, tell me a little about your history. What kind of medicine are you on? I want the expertise of that person. I want them to probe. There's probably no more efficient way to get at information than asking questions than probing. But if you're dealing with what you might call tender, vulnerable areas, where people really would like to go deeper and they need help and they're in pain. Probing is efficient, but ineffective. It saves time now and takes much more time long run, as you found out in the early part of the role play. And so I'm creating a situation which essentially precludes autobiographical responses altogether, which means you can't come out of you. You have to come out of me and to reflect it accurately and completely. Not to do it as some little listening technique, but to do it deeply and sincerely is another thing altogether. I'll give you a key. Have you ever spoken through a translator? Tell me, what did the translator do? the whole time you were giving that speech to that group, that audience, or that person. Where was the frame of mind of the translator? It's really trying to get my feeling, or the, the, the essence of the, the message. Okay, and then to communicate it accurately and completely. Not just the content, but the feeling, right? Catch the role. Catch the role. You're a faithful translator, and then within that role, you'll catch the feeling. Now, watch how relatively easy it will be for him. <laughs> Here's the mother. You're my translator. In a sense, you're standing right next to me, see? And we're talking to the mother. <sighs> yeah, I mean, this... This school is so important, Mom. It just is, it's just the whole key to the person's future. You see, I speak one language, she speaks another, so I've had to work through a translator. 
you are a faithful translator to me. I just, you just need it, Mom. I mean, it's, it's just so important, Mom. It feels very strongly about the importance of education in his life. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> See how basically simple that was? You hadn't figured me out? <laughs> you didn't deal with Joe? I wasn't into Joe. You didn't probe? You didn't agree? You didn't disagree? You didn't evaluate? You were with my head. You captured the essence of my feeling, how strong I feel about education. Yeah, Dad, I... I don't know. I, just a lot of problems out there. and Boy, they really throw your world sometimes. I can sense that that you're really troubled about, uh, about your surroundings. <laughs> really? Now look, see, you're, you're getting at it. Whether it's exactly on the spirit is, you are into me. You're not figuring me out. You're not trying to analyze me. You're not, you're not trying to take control. You're not trying to manipulate me towards some worthy end. The key to listening is with the eyes and the heart. Mom, here's your translator. Uh, yeah, I... <clears throat> it's hard to talk about this. It's hard. Hard to talk about this. It's a struggle. Not easy. You almost got to get your own spirit. Not that you are agreeing, but that you're so empathic, not sympathetic. Sympathy is not empathy. And this is why many people think that you can't really do this unless you've had the experience of the other, the opposite. It's because you haven't had the experience you empathize. If you have, you could sympathize. Sympathy is an altogether different response. It also has its appropriate uses. I'm sorry you lost your father. I just so sorry to hear about that. It must be such a hard, you know. I'm not talking about sympathy, empathy. Notice how you're working. The one who listens does the most work, not the one who speaks. Now, Dad, I, I took this test and, you know, I, they put me at the seventh grade level. Here I am in the tenth, and I, I just had no idea. I, none at all, I mean, but I'll tell you this. At least it kind of felt good to know where I'm standing. He feels relieved, at least he knows. One word, not long answers. One, two, three words sometimes. When you're obviously understanding the content, you don't need to restate the content. Get at the feeling. If you're not sure you understand the content, restate it. If you're not sure the other person feels the content has been understood, restate it. In either condition. And when you're dealing with emotional issues is the time to really practice, to really use true empathic communication. Those are the three primary times. When you're not sure you understand, when you're not sure the other feels understood, or when the issue is really kind of charged with emotion. Seek to understand. I'm going to role play for a second with this boy. Well, son, what score did you get? Son, you know, at one time in my life, <laughs> can't you instantly see? Well, son, I wouldn't get too discouraged about that because the key is that you learn from that and you can... What about advice? Or what about 
sympathy. Oh, don't, 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 don't worry about that's okay, son. We understand. Or what about agreeing? Well, I agree. I can see why you're so upset and, and why you're so disturbed. And I think what we should do maybe, or to disagree. Well, I don't know if that was a good test. What kind of a test was that? I've heard about some of these tests and it discourages young people. And I don't want you to feel discouraged, son, because I think you're further than that. I'd like to check into that. You see, everyone here once you get into an empathic frame of mind, you know instantly the futility and the counterproductiveness of people who try to be understanding and helpful through autobiographical approaches. That's why you would be doubly careful about anything you do at this stage, because now you are on holy ground. You really are. And I'm so vulnerable to you. Dad, I, I mean, I don't see any way out. Oh, he's just hopeless. Beautiful. Feeling of hopelessness. Yeah, I mean, do you see any way, Dad? He's asking for advice. Beautiful. See? You didn't say, yes, I do. You stayed as a faithful translator. You didn't say, I have some ideas, son. He basically said, you want my reaction. He's asking for advice. See? He's asking for some help. I mean, where are we now in the eyeglass demonstration? Where are we now? We've completed the diagnosis. And this will become one of the most bonding experiences we can have because of what we've had to go through. You're asking for my help. You want to know. Yeah. You want I, to know if there's any options out there. That that's, that can I don't, you, you know, right at this stage, see? I see something, son. Really? What? Tutoring? I've checked into tutoring two nights every week, all day Saturday be too much. Beautiful. Look what she did. As soon as I got into my emotion, see, now we're dealing with an action plan, but I'm back into my emotion. She stays with empathy. You go to empathy when the person has a lot of emotion attached there and has the need to be understood. If the rapport between you is extremely high, you hardly even have to say a thing. Or be just one word or a nod may be sufficient. That was tremendous. <sighs> yeah, if I, if I really thought that tutoring course would help, I'd give up everything. I'd give up any night. If you believed it would work, then you'd make the sacrifices. Yeah, I would. Do you think it would? You want my reaction to it. I do, Dad. I think it would, son. Let me tell you why. I'm open, see. We're synergistically creating a new thing. We're at a whole different stage now. Okay, let's do a little review of this concept of empathy. And let me describe the five phases of learning empathic responses. Mimicking, paraphrasing or rephrasing, okay? You say their words, their meaning in new words. There's the faithful translation on content. The third, reflect feeling. It's hurting, it's pain, frustrating, happy, relieved, see? Just, you're listening with the eyes and the heart. You're listening to body language. Your, your head is in where that person is. Fourth, rephrase content and reflect feeling. 
It's relieving to at last find out where you are on these tests in reading or whatever, see. And the fifth is to kind of just say nothing. You're just with the person and they can sense it. And you do that when you feel confident that they feel understood and that they know you understand. That's all part of habit five. To seek first to understand is to get an education. To seek first to understand is to do surveys with customers. To seek first to understand is to empathically be a faithful translator to another. To seek first to understand is to never even having related to another person. To know there are certain generic needs in all people. That which is most personal is most general. Therefore, there's a certain civility, a certain courtesy, a certain basic kindness, a certain basic treatment that apply across the board that basically tap into those universal principles we have spoken about before. And the last half of Habit 5 is just the concept of then to be understood, then judge, then act then go into problem solving. Now, test this, my friends. Test the power of this. Next time you get into a difficult situation, just say to yourself, the end in mind I have is not my way. Instead, it's a better way that has not yet been discovered. I'm going to just empathize. I would like to have this opportunity. Whether that really logically comes out of it, I don't know. I remember one situation. I had taught habits four, five, and six. And then I said, tonight, practice it. In some situation. And tomorrow morning, report back on your experience. The person came in. I cannot believe what happened last night. It was a real estate situation. He said, I've been working on this commercial real estate situation for eight months. All my eggs were in one basket. I had no income. I was very dependent upon this situation. I was so vulnerable, so desperate, and I'd been doing everything I could to finesse, to make it look like it would be win-win, but one way or another, I was going to win that deal. Last night, we went to a hotel room with the party that we're trying to deal with, and he had his attorney there, his accountant, and there was another real estate person brought in. And he said, my heart sunk. And he could see the handwriting on the wall. It wasn't going to go in his direction. And then he said, I'm going to lose this. Why not try what a teacher taught me today? He said, if I'm going to lose it anyway, why not try it? And he said to the person, he had to really kind of breathe deep and be prepared. I may lose it, but I'm going to try it. Let me see if I understand what it is you really want and what your most fundamental concerns and needs are. I hear you saying, correct me if I'm wrong. And they, he started to put it forth. The other person said yes, and then, and he just stayed with listening from within the frame of reference of the other. He started to listen fully. He learned some things he had not learned before. He didn't rush in. He had enough discipline and patience to not rush in with his good solutions and based on his past mentored formula of success. He listened. He was open. He started coming forth more and more. He started to learn. He persisted for no more than about 15, 20 minutes. The man said, 
Would you excuse me for a moment? He went to the other side of the room, picked up the phone, called his wife, turned back and said, you've got the deal. This guy was aghast. He said, I had no idea what happened. I tried to explain. Far more important than the technical elements of the deal was the quality of the relationship. That's the power of it. Habit six, synergize, in a sense, is the fruit of the spirit of win-win, habit four. The spirit of seeking first to understand, then to be understood, habit five. Then what happens is a very powerful thing. When people begin to interact together genuinely and they're open to each other's influence, they begin to get new insight. Something happens to them both. It creates the possibility of third alternatives, not the either-or approach, not win-lose, lose-win, not compromise. Compromise is one plus one equals one and a half. Positive synergy is one plus one equals three. Negative synergy, one plus one equals one half. In other words, so much of the effort and energy is spent in the adversarialism, in conflict and defensive and protective communication that literally it just wastes the energy of the enterprise, of the marriage, of the family. Anyone who has experienced sustained conflict and contention, they know that very little productivity can come out. So just remember those definitions. Synergy is where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Synergy means you can literally produce something that neither of you could have produced before and even adding what each can produce separately. One plus one equaling two is not synergy. Negative synergy where there is internal contention and adversarialism produces less than even what one person can usually produce on their own. Because so much of the energy is wasted going in the wrong direction and is counterproductive. Now the traditional paradigm is one of compromise. That's literally where most people think we end up realistically. And it often is the case if you're in low trust cultures. But compromise isn't necessary if people will pay the price with habits four, five, and six. The key to habit six, synergize, in fact you could almost say the fundamental principle of six is to always value differences. It's not something you just accept that there are differences. It's not something that you tolerate. It's not something that is legislated through diversity programs. It is something that you celebrate. I mean genuinely. The strength lies in differences, not in similarities. However, if there is not a common purpose and a common set of principles a buy-in to these universal principles we've been talking about, diversity, differences, can result in chaos and negative synergy. And it spawns prejudice, pre 
judgment. And remember, prejudice is a protection against being vulnerable. If I get my security from my ability to manipulate people as things, and I can classify them, it protects me, see? I don't have to deal with people. I just deal with categories, and I have them labeled, and then I get into the self-fulfilling prophecy, and it is a seedbed to all kinds of other problems. That's why it requires this integrity of the first three habits. It requires the development of a common purpose, a common sense of meaning, a common sense of mission. What is it we're about? The moment you can achieve that, then run with differences in perceptions, in gifts, in talents. The more you have difference, the better. The capability of inventing new approaches, third alternatives, is increased exponentially because of differences. Strength literally lies in difference. These aren't just nice words to value differences. These are moral imperatives for those that really want to solve problems in entirely new ways. Go for synergy. So the moment someone disagrees with you, what do you say to them? Good. You see it differently. That's why I so value my wife's input, because I'll say, well, how do you see it? And she'll see it totally differently. But honestly, if you can learn to value differences and teach your children, the moment there's a difference, run with it. It's an advantage, not a disadvantage. Let's take an issue, say, on the environment. That's a tender area for many people who have very strong feelings. How many here tend to be really strongly identified with kind of the purest approach to the protection and preservation of our environment, our water, our air, and so forth? How many feel like that purest approach goes simply too far and does not respect enough the necessity for the development and that it can be done in a way that will not violate? They would tend to be more on the other side of this continuum. Looks like about equal, doesn't it? Can we have a representative of, of the first one? Someone? Okay, would you come down for a moment? A representative of the second one. You have to be a person who really feels strong that the environmental thing has just simply gone way too far. It's out of whack. Someone? Anyone be a representative? Okay, would you come down, please? <laughs> you're? Diana. Diana? Mm -hmm. And you're? Carl. Carl. Good. Meet Diana. Hi, Diana. Hi, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now, I'm going to ask them both that are you prepared to look for a solution that is better than the one you have in your head right now? Yes. Or the one that you have in your head? <laughs> Okay, you, uh, yes. Are you? <laughs> kind of. <laughs> I am. I just think they're trashing our planet. <laughs> yeah, you have strong feelings about that. Yeah, I mean, I do. Right, and that we're going to suffer irreparably. Of course, look at the rainforest. Look what they're doing. You should see our canyons. <laughs> okay, so, yeah, but I am open-minded. <laughs> <laughs> Now, why does habit four precede habit five? Now look, they need to have a kind of common purpose, which is what? Synergy. The purpose is to find a solution that is better than the one she's going to recommend and better than the one he believes in. 
better. Now, I don't believe in the short period of time we're going to do this. We may be able to achieve it. Usually it takes about an hour to two. Now, are you prepared to go for a solution, not the one that you're thinking of in your mind, but one that is better than the one you're thinking of? Yes. What is the goal here? Yeah, they've got to think deeply win-win toward the purpose of synergy. Synergy is the fruit. So your purpose is to go for synergy. Now, unless they're anchored sufficiently inside themselves that the security lies primarily not in their positions and views, but in their integrity to principles, I really question whether people can practice habits four, five, and six. But this woman feels deep and strong. And we have to be careful that we don't judge her. See, to judge her because of her deep convictions would put us into kind of a win-lose attitude toward her. And also with him. Maybe he hasn't articulated the depth of his feeling to the rest of us as much, but they both have at least a tentative attitude toward win-win. Tentative. They don't know what it's going to be. And that usually happens. You don't know what's going to happen. A third mind has to be created. But I could guarantee you, once you get that, you're on your way to third alternatives. Now I'm going to intervene occasionally to kind of reinforce the habits. But you too, Go ahead and communicate for a minute. I believe that the forest, the valleys, everything should be kept pristine so that we can enjoy them that way. I don't think we need all this other stuff. Well, I can appreciate that point of view, but there's a certain amount of technology and progress we do need to make. But why? That's what they've said since the beginning of all time, and look what they've done. I understand that, but let me see if I can help us both understand this idea. Okay. Seek first to understand. Yes. Synthetic clothes on. Yes. <laughs> this, this was from a silk worm. Yeah. Uh, okay. How the yeah. shoes? The shoes, they're... they're well, Not any dead animals there? No, no cows? No, no, no dead animals. Leather, no, no leather? No, no dead animals. I like my leather shoes, but, but let me just say... Yeah, so did the I, cow. I, I appreciate that, that there has to be a reasonable amount of progress. Right. There has to be a reasonable amount of, of preservation. Right. Don't you think progress has gone too far, though? Apparently you do. <laughs> well, I don't know. This is just and most of the, most of the people. cotton. That's right. But we make it out of petroleum. I'm just suggesting that okay. there's a certain amount of progress, of technology, of production that we do need. Some say the production machine has gone too far, mm -hmm. that we're, we're spoiling the environment. I think we ought to be cautious we have to be reasonable. Do you but, agree? But has, isn't that what everyone said since the beginning of all time? Okay, I mean, now let me ask the two of you for a moment. What is habit five? Could you both restate habit five? Um, to, uh, to understand. To understand and be understood? To understand first, first or second. First. What first. has been our initial tendency here? To help her understand. <laughs> <laughs> to help her with habit five. <laughs> you need this. Eh? Thank you. I feel so much better. <laughs> well, why don't y'all understand? I mean, what is the problem here? No, I do understand. I do. Let's establish a ground rule. You cannot make your point until you restate the other's point to his or her satisfaction. Now I'm going to insist on that, and the other has to feel understood. Okay. You want me to restate his point? Yes. Go ahead and restate his point. Okay, so you believe that uh, with and this is where you see the magic thing happening. Progress should move forward and because it would Air. help what our economy? Is that what you're saying? Or tell me why you think 
we need to move forward. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can't you, you can't ask questions because in a sense your questions are rhetorical statements okay you have to restate his point of view until he feels understood and you can't do anything until that's been it's so done hard when I don't understand him. <laughs> <laughs> okay so you believe that we should move forward with technology in a cautious way. In a cautious way. Preserving the environment. Preserving the environment. Okay. It's a very difficult balance to get. When the demand is high for production, uh -huh. and maybe regulation is low mm -hmm. on the environment, mm -hmm. it, it's easy to let the bottom line push your production. Mm -hmm. And so... The uh, test of five is... It's difficult. Do you listen with the intent to reply or with the intent to understand? So you're That's the thing to look for. That if we use proper balance and watch what we're producing, that we can do this with wisdom and it won't affect the environment so badly that my little critters will die. <laughs> well, I hope so. I think so. And, and what about the environment? What about the environment? You know, do you feel like that she understands at least the first part of your feelings and your convictions? Partially, I, th I think... I don't know if she's mimicking yet or it, not. It, it's, I can find it's, out, it's not that she agrees. <laughs> it's not that she agrees. That's yeah. not the issue. All right. She's not even taking a position. She's only seeking to understand. Do you feel like she has achieved that? At least, not the deepest understanding, but as much as you've kind of said to this point. You don't know. I you don't really know. question it. Let me ask you for, for a moment. As you are listening to him, uh -huh. are you preparing your reply? No. Are you judging what he's saying? I'm trying very hard to listen. You're really working hard. I can I'm tell that. I'm trying hard to listen. Yeah. And I'm really trying hard to understand. You're really trying hard to understand. Those are two different things. Listening and understanding right. are two different well, things. Well, you're listening for understanding, mm -hmm. not listening to reply, right. not listening I'm to listening judge. For understanding. You're listening for understanding, which means you have to get into his frame of reference, how he sees it, see? I know. Until he feels understood. What, first of all, do you notice between the spirit between the two of you right now, compared to before? I'm listening. Right. Less adversarial. Isn't it a lot less adversarial? Mm -hmm. Right. That's true. And adversarialism is a seedbed to all kinds of other things. Mm -hmm. So you're avoiding that seedbed. All right. Now, maybe on a 10-point scale, would you give her a 5? Yes. All right. What would you have given yourself? A 1. A 1? <laughs> well, that's interesting. Yeah. That's the use of self-knowledge, see? That is so vital because when you're working with yourself, you're saying, wait a minute, be patient. My day in court will come. My job now is to only understand I am not to judge. I am not to agree. I am not to disagree. I'm going to persist. I would give myself a one. My guess is his five was generous. <laughs> but... Let's just persist for a moment and ask you to do the same thing, okay? To understand her. You try to go, if you can, for an 8 or 9 or 10. Okay. In other words, make her point as well as she made it and express the depth of her conviction. Go ahead. How bad is the environment? It's terrible. It's so bad. You should go up in the mountains and see it. It's sad what they're doing to the animals. It's terrible. Uh -huh. We can't do this. What are we leaving to our children? Okay. What is, what am I, what is my granddaughter going to have? So the future The future is grim. depends on us. I mean, look what we've done. Mm -hmm. It's our generation. We're the one that so sophisticated everything. We're the one that we're dumping all that garbage in our oceans. So we're, we're the responsible group. Exactly. We're the ones that have to stop it and change the way we're looking at the environment. All right. Um, 
So we've got to do the intervention. We've we've got to make the change. We've got to we've got to who turn it around. Will? The animals can't do it. <clears throat> Seriously, who can do it for them? If we aren't economically responsible, who will be? Okay. Okay. Now try to fully express as much as you can her whole expression that she's given from the beginning, and let's see if she feels understood. Okay. Uh, the environment is going down in quality and uh, the animals are suffering, the landscape is suffering, it's changing its appearance. Um, the people in time will have a lower quality of life because the environment is getting worse and the children will inherit something of lesser quality than we have today. The animals um, are suffering because we're putting on them garbage and um, we're destroying their environment, their quality of life. Exactly. That's true. Okay, now, what would you give him on a scale of 1 to 10 in terms of his understanding of your point? Not that he's taken any mm -hmm. position on it yet. I'd give him a 7 or an 8. 7 or an 8. What would you have given yourself? Um, probably not quite that high. Did you find yourself kind of preparing to reply a little, waiting for, it's my turn a little later and therefore I'll kind of use this, or were you genuinely empathic in understanding? Well, from, uh, from listening to what we've talked about here the last couple of days, I, I did want to hear what she had to say and to see if I could see the validity of her point. But see, then, in a sense, you're seeking to understand in order to judge later. Or to take a position later. Take a position later. What about the total openness of just seeking to understand with no intent to judge at all? Uh, my initial thought would be, where am I going then? Wh where is this going if it's not going someplace? Rem I guess I no. seek a direction. Wh what's our purpose? What is the goal we established? What's our habit to purpose? Is to find mm -hmm. what? Compromise? Well, to, to a, a compromise? Not a compromise. No. But, but that's what you really meant is synergy. Right. Right. Uh, a higher understanding and a solution that is better than the one you're recommending exactly. and better than the one. See, that's your habit too. Mm -hmm. That's really what you're going after. It's better. I'll tell you why. You both live on this earth. Your families live on this earth. The whole human race is interdependent. That's your point. The exactly. ecological nature, which you also respect. Okay, now, what do the two of you sense just about the quality of the relationship with each other compared to the earlier interaction? I would at least sit down and talk to him. I can I live mean, in the same world she lives in. You have no choice. <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, but I mean, I could live with the environmental movement. I can understand it. Do you find yourself changed at all because of your respect for the fact of his convictions and feelings on this issue? I didn't say if your total position has changed at all, okay. but your perception of him. Yes, my perception of him. How about you? Has your perception of her changed because of this little interaction at all? I think I understand her position. I think what we should do in production is maybe have someone of the environment a part of the production process. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, when you did this little exercise here, or when you saw it done here, you noticed the real sincere effort of openness and wanting to be influenced, and then of having influence, and how synergy resulted. Well. I sense more of the spirit of reverence and respect than we saw earlier. Thank you both. Appreciate that. Now, the little role play we saw here, 
Why is it that that works? That it produces something that is synergistic? And by the way, some of you may be wondering, well, does that mean I sell out of my principles and values? The opposite. You actualize your principles and values, and when you come up with the last half of habit five, then to be understood, you can fully articulate. But when you go into habit six, synergy, the dynamic interaction of those people start to create solutions that are so opposite sometimes than the original intention of one for the other. These may be just words to you until you experience it. You could hear this and still tonight get embroiled with your spouse in a fight or with your kids. You could leave this very assembly and have some negative interaction with someone and immediately seek first to be understood. The most dreaded thing to happen in a marriage or in a family is to destroy the ability to communicate synergistically and to solve problems. You see the world not as it is, but as you are. Most of us tend to think we see objectively Unaware, we're looking through our lens of experience, of conditioning, of scripting. We call that a paradigm, a pair of glasses, the frame of reference out of which you operate, the implicit assumptions you operate on. Now, the key to objectivity is to accept subjectivity is to be aware. I do not see the world as it is. I see the world as I am. Therefore, if there is a difference, what? Someone else sees it differently based upon their experiences. I need their experience. Otherwise, I will suffer forever from an insufficiency of data. So this concept of valuing differences is just not a good idea. It's not just something that brings unity. It's something that creates, through a cooperative communication process, whole new options, new alternatives. And this idea of humility, of accepting your subjective involvement, is not just some nice principle. It is a reality that people see things differently. And you need access to that. And through the interaction, the spirit of win-win, habit four, the spirit of seeking first to understand, then to be understood, habit five. And as the people respectfully, empathically communicate with each other back and forth, something new happens. I mean, I maintain you can take any issue you want and create a third alternative. If people will practice habits four, five, and six, I am genuinely excited by this experience we just had because I see in the power of four, five, and six the capability of solving any human problem.